smells like good times and victory. Ardun, good morning. Watto, friend. Sorry, let me get some tunes going. Oh, we can just sit in abject silence while I loudly sip coffee. <laughs> uh, Alnus Bacon Avenger, good morning, friends. How are you doing? Ooh. Oh, that is very strong. Good times. <laughs> Sorry, how are you doing, friends? There we go. Uh, if it seems like I have a certain whimsical giggles about me, it is because uh, Hollywood actor and movie director uh, Jorgen... Uh, I can never pronounce his surname. Uh, Jordan, uh, it's like Vot Roberts, Vogget Roberts. Uh, managed to get trolled by the hard drive, and it's just giving me hope. <laughs> Yo, it's that time of the month again. Catch Will. But how can you catch me if I'm on fire? That's science. Sorry. I have a very, very silly mood about me this morning. Um, but Autozini, sincerely thank you for 16 months, yo. Um, soon, soon, we're going to be able to roll out... Um, new badges uh, up until three and a half years now i believe twitch lets you pick previous sub badges to choose from so yeah i'm getting i'm getting a rush on it as quick as i can but they just rolled that out yesterday at the same time as i'm sorting this charity thing and i'm like no <laughs> it all happens at once So yeah, sorry, how are you doing? What has been going on video gaming news wise? Thankfully plenty of good stuff. Uh, Harmonious, good morning. What oh friend? Uh, also I've got a gloriously weird game that I've been saving for ages. So Today's gonna be a good day, yo. I mean, I'll wait for more peeps to get in before we leap into all the... Oh, excuse me. The good spicy uh, game news. Re-enter online. Sensors online. <laughs> Weapons online. All systems nominal. There's a kernel of truth that when in trying to find good games, you must separate the wheat from the chaff, but it's interesting to see you so quinoa quinoa on this one. I can barley wait so hot to it. Something, something, something corn. Something, Ooh, something complete. Thank you, Fiona! This is Fiona doing a host. Uh, Alnus, thank you not only for 32 months, but for a uh, a Guilty Gear loud announcer level of corn puns there. Thank you. Oh, Step Gen Watto, lost flowers! Good morning, Watto, friend! Wraith, Watto, and welcome. Coming in, coming in. Oh. Coffee's got punch. Hey! Swan Dragon, good morning. Sensors oh, online. Cool. Weapons online. All systems nominal. What ho? There's so much smoke in the air that the outdoors is in desperate need of a jazz singer. Ha! <laughs> Moose, thank you for 33 months, you feckin' ledge. Um, and for, you know, all the feckin' stuff that you do. So... Watto, Moose, and thank you. Uh, to view um, I would not describe myself as a posh individual. However, due to one of my formal, my only formal qualification, that being in stage and theatre acting, I can put on an overpronounced style of the posh if one is required to do so. And Ross, Watto, friend, coming in, coming in. I've put lights on! Oh, I'm being a stupid! Oh, it's, it's hidden behind uh, the Easy 8 uh, and the uh, GM Sniper 2. You know, those, those well known, those well known individuals. Uh, how are you all doing, friends? Ems, what ho? Coming in, coming in. <laughs> Alright, Ross is saying that I do have a posh accent. It's, it's lilting. Right, okay. It throws a lot of people off in the States because, like, 
I grew up in the arse end of nowhere, but my my parental unit tried to drill proper pronunciation into me as a as a babu. So I had a very very uh, had a posh accent, despite being in a you know, just a very rural part of the UK. It was one of those areas that by the time I left, it had been um, gentrified by weekenders. But as I was growing up, it was all like farmers' kids and shit. Um, so. As anyone who goes through the British schooling system, I basically had to learn how to drop the accent lest I get the, the poo beaten out of me. But then I did theatre. So then I had to relearn correct pronunciations. And then I moved to London, which is just a melting pot of a gajillion different accents. So by the time I was like moving overseas, my accent goes everywhere. So, I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> oh, Mr. Squarepeg, Kimble. What ho, friends, Ehrman to smook. What ho. How are you doing, you lovely mother hubbards? Steel Fox, what ho, good morning. Lyris, good morning, what ho, friend. Coming in, coming in. I have a gloriously weird game for today. Oh, Dismook says that their accent. Oh. What her will. May there be many more after this. To the Lost Flowers. If I have done if I have done good enough to be entertaining for six months, then that makes me very happy. And if I can continue to at least be like a vaguely good conversationalist. Yeah. Here's to many more. <laughs> DJ Watto to Viewer. Uh, thank you kindly for the follow. Um yeah, Dismook was saying that their accent goes from deep Suffolk to Londoner to American. God. I've weirdly become more... <coughs> okay, I use more colloquialisms, British colloquialisms, in my language and my day-to-day -day since moving overseas than I did when I was in the UK, which is very strange. There are certain... There are certain words that are kind of creeping into my vocab that have, like, the Americanisms. Like taco instead of taco. Enter online. Sensors online. Weapons online. Nope. All systems nominal. What ho time to work and look oh my fine look. Well, Gilmar Greyjoy, cheers to you. Um, I shall endeavour to be vaguely entertaining in the background while you get your stuff done. But, no, sorry. Uh, Gilmar Greyjoy, thank you for 18 months. I, that's... That's a large amount of time. So, back and cheers to you. Uh, and I guess, I mean, DJ, I don't, I try not to flash them too, too much. Uh, this one, so I got this one in celebration. Um, the Artsy Poe drew this, and it was the first bit of fan art we got. So, me and Echo went up to Cap Hill and got tattoos, and I got this one. Uh, this was one of the days we had the uh, internet outage at Ket's place. So I just rolled down to Georgetown and just got the tat. Because it was like, what can I get off the bat? Uh, the Slug Cats was the same reason, but it was um, Gameworks when they had full internet outage. So we just went up the road into Seattle proper, and I got the three Slug Cats, which I'm still very, very happy with. Uh, and this one, uh, Tia came round here to get it done, so... Uh, and Reflective, how are you doing, friend? What ho and welcome. Oh, Jackie Fox. Uh, who's not got a proper hello? Nom nom fighter, what ho, friend? So, coming in, coming in. Uh, Alna says that uh, they're from Yorkshire, but there's hints. There's hints of that, but my accent is a lot more posh, and my parents had no idea where it came from. Language, isn't it weird? What are we cool? Uh, so Jackie's uh, put down money on a new tat. Swan Dragon, no, you don't need to cut the power to get more tattoos in. Um, my goal is hopefully, with things getting slowly better here in Seattle, there's a very, very good friend of ours that, uh, the same one that did this, who I'd like to invite back into the studio. Um, the next tattoo I want to get is um, the address of the center of the universe. That's probably the next thing I'll get. Um, and then we've just got to work out which other longship things do we need on here, you know? Oh, Jackie says it's first tattoo. Oh, so where are you going? 
Uh, and Ikoa, thank you very kindly for asking how No Great November's going. Uh, I'm woefully behind. <laughs> I'm woefully behind. But I'm behind because I'm sorting out the charity event. So I've still got, I've got pieces I've been inking here sitting at me and judging me in their brightly colored style. Chazini, just stay safe. You know, you know we gonna. Uh, and Dismu keeps telling the idea of a sleeve tattoo. I... Obviously, I, you know, I'm very, very pro-tattoos. Shocking, I know. Uh, I will say... Sometimes you can get bogged down with big, big, big designs. It's okay to get a lot of little ones because what you can do is a good artist can give you essentially that um, under pattern to give it a sleeve-like cadence. Oh, and Catastros, I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, sorry you're having a, a rotten cold. Who wants to sing? Oh, and Sin's Den, thank you for the host. Yeah, sorry you're going through a rotten cold, friend, but... Cheers to you and hoping you heal fast. Fearless, Watto friend. Reactor online. Sensors <laughs> online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Two years B. Also, the first screenshot of this game on Steam is Fukan terrifying Viking yep. 64 hug Viking 64 hug Viking 64 Frando Guinea 12 week. Yup. Feckin' terrifying. Um, however, the game we're playing today does skew more towards humor than than fear. But it is going to contain some gloriously unsettling character designs, which I've been saving. Um, oh yeah, and Lost Flowers. I do need the Monster Hunt bowgun tattoo. God, I never would have thought I'd become a heavy bowgun main. Like, oh, and Vanderbeast. Head of House Order, thank you kindly for filling the pint glass. I hope I said hello when you came in, Vanderbeast. Um, but yeah, so Jackie Fox, um, I meant to ask, where are you getting the tattoo? I'm sorry, this will you'll have this problem between now and actually getting the ink, is that anytime you tell someone who's got tattoos, they'll feel almost responsible for, for your success. They'll feel the need to tell you literally everything about their tattoos. I'm sorry, it's kind of... I guess it's like when... It's not like when people talk about their pets. I haven't got really an equivocate. Uh, also, uh, I know I might be the only, only person that desperately cares about this. However, Samurai Gun 2 is out as of now. Um, so, this is probably the one fighting game that I keep up with, you know? Oh, Jackie said it's going to be on the inside of their forearm. Okay, I mean this bit here. <laughs> oh, inside a forearm, God. Yeah, can you tell I desperately need this coffee? So, not too dissimilar from this. Honestly, this was real, real easy going, so... Like... Oh, and Catros, I'm glad one of us has actually got their, uh, their feckin' hat on today. Uh, sorry, Catros was linking to the game we're playing today. So yeah, Maze is a gloriously weird little... I think calling it a point and click might be a little... I don't want to say derivative, but it's certainly a... What's the term? It's going to be interesting. You know what? I'm just going to leave it at that. Oh, Ems has uh, kill screen related news. I'd lay it on us. Although, i got to say, Ems, that... Unless it is the uh, about how the director of the Metal Gear Solid movie, who also played um, Poe Danfren in Star Wars, 
uh, got trolled by the hard drive this morning. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's currently taken the cake as my favorite story of the day. Oh, it's about control. Okay, did the is the thing happening? Also, Wolfcrat, Watto, uh, and Scar Red Tiger. I hope I said hello when you came in. And if I didn't, Watto and welcome. The thing is happening. All right. Feckin' you. Keeping that up in a tab. Feckin' yo. Okay. Friends, check out the thing that M's linked. Uh, I will... Uh, I will put myself uh, in for that properly later. Oh. So yeah, how are you doing, you lovely mother hubbards? There's been a fair wedge of video game news the last couple of days, so there's. to decide where to start, you know? Oh, What ho. This <laughs> came about fast. You bloody did, didn't it? Uh, Stammering Gamer, thank you for 13 months at a tier 2. And for hanging out on the regular, y'all. I hope I say that enough, friendos. Yeah, coffee's definitely... Ah! Jay Boast, thank you for the 100 bits. Uh, an alleged what ho and good morning. Uh, I already cleared all of the single player content for Samurai Gun already. So all that's really left is to fall out with my nearest and dearest playing multiplayer. <laughs> Thankfully, I've got a lot going on this week. So that'll keep me from just binge fighting it until nobody wants to hang out with me anymore. Like, friendos, you know how we all have that game where we were that person? For me, that's Samurai Gun. I used to play it so much. Oh, and Iris, thank you as well. Thank you, Lynch. Very cool of you. Um, but yeah, Samurai Gun was my just go-to. Um, God, I just played it far too much. We had a lot of like post-pub gaming back when I was at CA, and so we played. Oh, yeah. So yeah, alleged. Uh, definitely Nidhogg. You can do multiplayer. You can do online multiplayer with OG Nidhogg, right? And oh, Candarian, what ho, friend? Yeah, so I played a lot, a lot of those games, and for some reason, um, uh, for some reason, Samurai Gun just clicked. Crad, thank you kindly for the 100 as well. Uh, Bacon Avenger, thank you for filling the pint glass. And Stammering and Reflective for the, the teeny tiny bits. Thank you kindly. Sorry, here's me being a multi-track drifty potato. Um, yeah, I used to play an inordinate amount of Nidhogg. And, but Samurai Gun was the one that I practiced myself. There was just something about how there was such flexibility with such a simple moveset. I don't know, I just, I got real obsessed with it. Probably because I got close, I don't know if I managed to clear, I don't know if I managed to clear all achievements in the first one. But I gave it a bloody good go. missing two, achieve two achievements on this. None either question mark. Sorry. I was sure I'd cleared them all. So I, st I invested a very large amount of my life into this. What do you mean I don't have ten head belt? Well, uh, I know what I'm going to be doing with my life. 
Uh, apparently uh, trying to find uh, Rami Ismail hidden inside this game. Sorry, where were we? <laughs> anyway, I am thoroughly obsessed with Samurai Gun and will be playing it a whole bunch. I cannot promise that I will be a good person as an introduction to the series or as a... I've never necessarily been good at showing other people how to play fighting games. Uh, if you're interested in playing it and picking it up, uh, more training partners will be more than welcome. But this is... This is my sweaty tryhard mode. With Tekken, I can kind of ease back on the throttle and not go hard. But with this, I don't I don't know how to be calm. Um, I love OG Nidhogg. Um, so, alleged, I'd love to play at some point. Where is it? Oh, the feckin' go! Bertie's bouncing bomb away. <laughs> Stammering, you feckin' legend! And you kindly for a thousand bits! Feckin' yo! House Order was having such a good run, I was trying not to draw attention to it. That's feckin' cool of you, thank you. That's like, that is ten bucks to keeping us going. And, <laughs> okay. Online. Sensors online. Weapons online. I think it was All Unitax that nominal. procced it there. Okay, no. No. If we're doing this, and we are doing this, because this is a Tuesday morning, we are bringing the thunder proper. And as it's been two whole seconds since you've all had to listen to the Pokemon Sword and Shield theme. Alright, here we go. Ah! Uh, and Jackie, I will take a I will take a gander at that as soon as I can. There's a train. If you wanted a train, you got a train. Uh, anyone who wanted to get off at the first stop, though, it's just been skipped. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. Must be reestablished. Fucking yo! All right, there is a lot happening. All fucking yo! Oh, okay. Uh, what I was gonna say is, yeah, the the hype train banner is the great work of uh, of Harmful Rays, who is an exceptional artist. Um, fucking yo! So Bacon, Lyris, and Fearless filled up the pint glass. Uh, Ross took exception to that. Fearless busting out the iconic fan of knives, and Lyris following suit. Fucking yo. So those went to Numbs, Lord Asmodeus, Sindrin, Solon Face, Wolfie, the Proto, uh, and then Lyris tagged uh, Dizer Washbear? That is probably German and I'm killing it. Uh, Redbeard, uh, Shire, ooh woo. Um, Terra Luna the Bear, and Caster. Go Betty Fix you. Alice, no! <laughs> it's been so long since I've had to do this. It's all that Subnautica voting. Oh, God, I've unfurled me leggies. Alice, why are you like this? <laughs> Knifey family attack. The others having a great time with this. Hopper Get out of my house. <laughs> oh, Sea Witch. Always proud of you, Yor. But good on you. I, I am not very good at having breakfast when I should. But I am also a terrible example. Okay, it's it's feckin' popping off. The alerts have cannot keep up with you lot. Um, uh, along with Alice being a jerk, 
making me do stuff. Uh, stammering with another 500. Fearless with however many that is. Okay. I don't know how you all feel about that one. I think the sound needs to change. But I wanted to use the, uh, the gif and the alert from Memnol because I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, back at yo. Sorry, yeah, because after feck it, yo, Kaibal gave out five to the crowd. Feck it, yo. <laughs> the gif, uh, the the gif I love. The sound absolutely does not work, and I will try and find a new one. In my defense, I was just going over Turtles sound clips last night from the the, uh, the Turtles game, so. Oh, I had Catros. That sound is from Warcraft 2. And it's if you repeatedly click the um, the Horde transport. That's the Orc sing-along. Yeah, Alnus is with me. And once again, the throne for Stammering Gamer is there. The glass must be emptied. House Chaos have spoken. Look at your already beasted level four. Like Blade Nora. Like all of you friends, thank you so much. Like I, I hope my general sense of discombobulation doesn't detract from being fair and grateful. Oh, how good! Swan Dragon grabbed a screenshot of me dabbing. <laughs> There's no way that comes back to bite me in the ass. Leas and Fearless doing a side by side Alimu Ninjitsu maneuver like the climax of a shonen fight. Huh? Oh, yeah, like the crossover into the air, like fan of knives. Of course, there's a clip. There's always a clip. <laughs> fan of Beast, thank you for refilling the pie glass. Ross for 200, you feckin' legend. Alright, I promise I will change that sound effect after today, but it continues to make me chortle. Um, but sorry, what I should have said was, uh, Kaimal, Lirius, Fearless, thank you for all going on, like, gifting subs breeze, you feckin' legend. That's super cool of you. It's, it's still catching up. The alerts are still catching up. Is mine. Well, feckin' yo! <laughs> Stammering, you feckin' lich! <laughs> and Stammering, there's another thousand bits, you feckin' lich. You are determined to hold on to the Yolden. Like, I, I thought they were gonna be able to unseat you with today's adventures, but feckin' yo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, and numbers it's the alert from Memnol and I just grabbed a sound that I had of the uploaded ones and forgot it was the orcish singing one so I will change that later <laughs> it absolutely does not fit but it makes me smile oh, and ten win what ho I, I saw um, Hunt Showdown's been getting some new content stuff. I have another chance to get hands on. There's so much going on. Alright, and friendos. Thank you for a whole feckin' level four level of awesome. Like, sincerely thank you. Alright. Alright. 
Pokemans. <laughs> House Chaos. House Chaos no they know. No, sorry. I don't wanna I don't wanna sound contrite, like I apologize that I'm kind of firing off in like 50 different directions. That's pretty much gonna be my modus operandi this week. Um I am both very excited and very nervous about the charity event on Saturday. So the fact that here's the reason why. And it kind of ties into like all the trains and everything. You lot literally keep me alive. That little train we just had, that isn't like, you know, money that's going to go into my, I don't know, blackjack for guinea pigs fund. Like, that will pay for my food, my rent, and coffee and my cup. Like, so, I know I say this on the regular, but I really do sincerely hope you know how much that stuff means to me. And the fact is, I'm going to be asking you to donate money to charity on top of that. Oh yes, J Post. Let me get the uh, let me get the, the the let me get the link up. Oof. So yeah, that's what we're 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 starting to already. I haven't finished all the alerts for it yet, but uh, we've got a good shopping list of things you're going to be able to do to wreck my face. I'm still working on it all. Yeah, um, Bacon Avenger, like, a bunch of people threw in, and um, El Ravenger threw in a whole bunch. We hit the initial feckin' target, which is why I've moved it up to, uh, to a grand and a half, which... Might be too much. I don't. I don't know. This is the first time I've ever done this as an individual, so I don't know. But like, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Let me just breathe. So yeah. If I, I seem a little discombobulated, that's that's the long and short of it. Um, I still live in constant fear that I sound like some contrite asshat. But that was mostly after watching Bo Burnham's Inside and the bit on the the little the little streaming parody bit. There's a cadence in which the guy says thank you for a sub in the manner that one might, as a reflex, flicking a bug off their shoulder. And I live in fear of becoming, I don't know, what's the term? Complacent? No. Narcissistic? To, to reach a point where I'm like, oh, well, that's just what I expect, you know? Entitled, Wolfcrad, you're right. That was the that was the one I was worried about. So yeah. Yeah, Lyris as well, yeah. Anyway. I know this is a bizarre thing to worry about, but I do. Okay, so uh Will's strange neuroses aside. Uh, <laughs> Alice is like, don't worry, if you get too big headed, make sure you're aware. Yeah, give me the the old uh lobber shoe at us. But like a like a soft shoe, not like a steel toe. Oh, I'm not that sturdy. <laughs> slippers, okay, chuck slippers. Right, so you want to talk about some video gamey stuff before we get started into some super weirdness? Um, God. So Final Fantasy XIV is taking over the world. Uh, I know all of you will be shocked and surprised to hear this. Uh, at this point, um, it's... 
it's fascinating to see this mass migration and the slow acquisition of users, especially towards like Heaven Sword content and stuff like that, has just been fascinating to watch. Uh, sorry, if you're wondering what prompted this conversation, um, so the Final Fantasy XIV dev team have been saying that they're desperately trying to combat um, server queues because of the sheer number of people just pouring into the game. Uh, now, we've got a lot of people on the longship who have played an inordinate amount of Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, and if you're in the Blackout Club on Friday, ask Kyle, because, oh boy, <laughs> Kyle has spent a lot of time in that game. So if you're considering trying it, you are entirely welcome, and there are loads of people to help, but it seems like you might have to wait, like, at least a, a week or so before leaping in, just due to, like, sheer amount of population growth that they're experiencing. Now, they do have the advantages of being able to move between data centers and servers and whatnot much easier than other online experiences, so... At this point, you'd need someone who knows it a lot better to tell you, like, who you can hang out with and how. But I know it's a lot better than when I tried playing it back in the day. <laughs> Alan, this is like, and Final Fantasy XIV has a free trial, and no, I will not be silenced! Uh, I honestly want to get Kyle quoting the meme on a t-shirt, and I don't know how to do that, but I want the- ha Oh, do you mean the award-winning MMO <laughs> with an unlimited free trial? Well, oh, and, uh, uh, Catastros, it's not, it's not throwing rocks at World of Warcraft to discuss this mass migration. And I think this is an interesting, um, it's an interesting discussion. Because, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, like, World of Warcraft has almost been, it's a very important touchstone in our industry. It took what was initially one of the most gatekeepy sectioned off hardcore spheres of PC gaming and made it incredibly accessible. And the success of that has carried it forward for so much longer than any one of its competitors. But at this point, they they are making missteps that aren't just the, the chagrin of the hardcore. Because we as professionals can chart user migration, you know, Users are moving away from World of Warcraft and onto Final Fantasy XIV. That's a thing that we can look at from a business standpoint. Now, as Katros is right that not tossing rocks, that it might be too soon to say the current um, explosion is staying. That's also very true. The other thing with World of Warcraft is that its user base dips and then they do another big bombastic um, expansion launch and server numbers surge again. I believe the last one, uh, they hit their their brand new um, concurrent players peak. So, it's very much a cycle. However, what's interesting is that, at least from what we can see industry side, the people moving away from World of Warcraft aren't doing it on an even spread. They are being pulled across on a Final Fantasy XIV. And, or at least the most direct translation of. So it's interesting to see migration from one Pizza title to power! Feckin' hell! J-Post! I haven't even finished the alerts! Feckin' hell! Fucking hell! I'm um, sorry, J Post. That's fucking cool of you. And J Post, you'd be very happy to know that caffeine's been working. Was working with me last night on on ways to mess with. Uh, I'm gonna have to... Uh, I'm probably gonna have to record voice lines for all the procs so that I know what I've got to do in case it happens very quickly. So they might end up with being multi-will level nonsense. But yo, that's a hundred dollars to a cause that... 
that matters to me very personally. So thank you. All right, that's feckin' cool of you. Feckin' yo. Thank you. That's that. Thank you. All right. Uh, also, so friendos, if I'm not asking anybody to do anything, um, there is a poll up on the page for which will be our starting turtle. Or let's put it another way: which is the best turtle? I'm not saying throw things on, but please let me know if you can see it because it should be pre-ready. Like I'm not going to push it ahead of time. It's just I have I was having some problems with getting it to proc yesterday. Oh, it's staring. I don't I don't know how to process like that's I mean feckin' El Ravager threw in so much. Like and that was last week. This is where it even started. I had to set a new goal. Like I, <laughs> And Fred, good morning and Watto. And Wolfcrad, I'm glad you like the alert. Like. Tide Mailer's like, stretch those goals, you numpty. <laughs> yeah. Cheers to you. Let's, let's go with that. Um. So okay. So I, as we're talking about the charity event, uh, as you may or may not, as okay, you probably know already. But this Saturday, we're doing a charity event. Uh, I am going to be playing the original. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the NES. Now, if you've not heard of this game, it is infamous for being a pure hellscape of bastardry. It is just... It is unfair, it is shenanigans, and it is brutal. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to play the game, and I'm going to beat it. However, I am going to allow you lot a myriad of ways to mess with the game live. And if you choose to stop me from trying to finish my goals, then so feckin' be it. Now, the way it's gonna work is that donations that go through Tiltify will end up, um... Pizza power! <laughs> ah! Alice, you feckin'... Well, I didn't mean to... Uh... Sorry, Almus, thank you for throwing in five bucks for for a feckin' cause. Um, Alice is pointing out the Superior Turtle is clearly Donatello. Donatello, so in this TED Talk... Now, Donatello is famously overpowered in this game. However, you lot will be able to make me change Turtle at any point, so I can't just camp Donatello and win easy. I've got to actually learn to play. Um, but no, Almus, thank you for testing that out for us. That's real cool. Uh, Donatello is in the lead with five dollars. <laughs> Swan Dragon, where's the TED talk, Alanis? Where's the TED talk? Um, so the way it will work is to make Will do horrendous things. Donating specific amounts will proc special alerts. Uh, there'll be a shopping list that you'll have access to. They're not set up now, so I can't like pre-test them. But they will vary from making me swap to the next turtle at any given moment uh, to physical exercise. And I believe the highest one will be at any point, you can just make me reset the game. No matter where I am, doesn't matter if I'm inches away from stabbing Krang in the eye, you can just reset the game. Um, 
Actually, Ikoa, you're, uh, there should be an exclamation charity event. If, let me set that up now if it's not already rolling. See, and this is why I like chatting with you a lot. Reminds me to do a thing. Okay, should... Boof! <laughs> oh, sorry, a friend was mentioning that most modern gamers could get through Contra or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for a little work. Ninja Gaiden Battletoads? Maybe not. I like that you're already pitching Battletoads for next year. I mentioned to someone that uh, that was already the case, and they asked me with a deadpan tone, why does Fred hate you? <laughs> I assume it's for the, the Ruboy. Ruboy! <laughs> I assume it's for that. And to, uh, I want to say Nuges? Nigers? I apologize, I keep getting the username wrong, but what a and welcome. <laughs> I'm sorry, Fred, I read that, uh, <laughs> I read that as cocaine powder, and I was like, Fred, are you breaking bad? Uh, and there goes. I'm doing real well today. Um, little, little tired. Um, the stuff of the charity event is slowly coming together. Uh, the things left to do are um, the overlays. Power. <laughs> ah. Stammering, you feckin' ledge! <laughs> um, stammering through in ten bucks for the charity event with Michelangelo is vastly superior. Three words, the last Ronin. Oh, heck. Uh, stammering, I've not actually read that one. Because, um, Stammering, it might have been you that mentioned it to me. Oh, and Fred. Uh, yeah, I had... Uh, it might have been Stammering was the person that told me about it. Because I was talking about the new animation that has, like, world-class, like, fight animation. There is a The Gang versus Shredder. Uh, and apparently in the newest animation, uh, Shredder's got a whole, like, Bane thing going on. And, like, cool, beefy Bane, not, um... <laughs> Batman level Bane or L Bane from Batman and Robin yeah sorry wow that threw me for a loop you feckin legends um, but it does mean that uh, yes Michelangelo is currently winning Um, and yeah, Fred, like, Battletoads is going to be a special one. But, touch wood, if it's a thing we decide to do uh, on the yearly, next time uh, we can have a player two in as well. Like, um, Pizza power! Can't trust you fucking ledge! 
I heard cat treasures are in 20 bucks. Uh, to uh, Snoopson, Watto and welcome. Uh, we're currently arguing over which is the best turtle via the medium of charitable donations to a charity that means a lot to me. I'm... Uh, though, uh, Katros was asking, like, top 10 Pokemon. Can I just say Tepic 10 times? <coughs> oh. No, and I should say, like, one of the reasons why I wanted to pick a game that's as brutal as this is kind of going back to what I was saying earlier. And... Pause this for just a second. Oh, Captain Stephanie Barnes, Watto, head of House Valkyrie. Um, you lot keep me alive. That's just the long and short of it. I feckin' love doing this, and I do consider this to be a real job. But in the same manner, like, you lot are feckin' highlight of my day. Like, I start this up, chat with you all day, and I get to do that because you lot yoke bits at my dumb face and keep me alive. Like, I don't even... I still don't know how to say enough thank yous for that. And the idea to ask you to throw in for even a good cause on top of that, like, I feel like I need to be prepared to do something that's worth it. I I need to be able to put in that blood, sweat, and tears for it. And I consider that particular game to be a special flavour of Feckery. Like a special flavour. I, I considered things like Jump King, I'd considered things like uh, Alt F4 and things like that, but I just... There's something pure about that old Turtles game that it's not... It wasn't designed to hurt, it just... It's so unforgivingly brutal. <laughs> Stammering says the Lion King. Uh, you don't feck with the mouse, my friend. You don't feck with the mouse. <laughs> so... Yeah, I guess emotionally I'm going to be all over the place. Oh, yeah. Just thank you all. All right, that's just what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> Feelings. Feelings! Yeah. So, on the charity event, I've got alerts and overlays left to do, and then clear up this space. Um, I'm going to invite a couple of people over to just hang, chat with you lot, like, make sure I don't... Go do Lally Tap. And then feckin' go from there. <laughs> Catch was just saying, this is the only time you can really describe something that crawled out of a sewer as pure. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Captain Steph being like, shouldn't be allowed to text while coming out of sedation on major pain meds. No. Um. I am I am lucky because the last time I had to take like proper proper pain meds, uh, I did not have access to a mobile phone. Uh, well, actually no, the last time I took proper pain meds was when I got this repaired, and they ran it through an IV, so I went from naught to completely wasted like that, but then sobered up just as quickly. It was very surreal, very very surreal. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, cheeky tea burps. <laughs> Iko was saying, we do have a time limit on the charity event. You're not going to die on stream because you didn't beat the game, right? <laughs> right? Well, I mean, my untimely demise probably won't happen for a while. Only the good die young, friends. Um, I guess we'll see how it goes. It won't end up being a 24-hour event, that's for sure. I could probably only keep going for like... Who wants to sing? Oh, and you just uh, thank you kindly for the host. Eventually, I will learn how to say your name. <laughs> but thank you kindly. Much like with Sekiro and things like that, eventually I will have to... I will have to admit defeat. But you know I don't admit defeat lightly. Who wants to sing? Oh, and Captain Steph, thank you for the host and all. <laughs> Call him a cat, what ho, friends? Come on in, come on in. Um, 
Aikoa was worried that at the charity event that I might be so stubborn as to uh, end up keeling over trying to beat the Turtles game. <laughs> okay, yeah, so Katros, J Post, you are correct. My stubbornness is known and my ability to stay up. So I will make sure that there is someone to stop me from literally killing myself. Who wants to sing? Ah, and Lost Flowers as well. Feckin' you all, all of you, thank you. Uh, it is annoying that I can't get Streamlabs to acknowledge um, auto hosts because a load of you do put this on your host lists and whatnot, and it makes so much difference. Okay, so Captain Steph's asking about today's game. Who wants to talk about sentient corn? Fucking yo! <laughs> oh, a J post with a, with a little house chaos mixer there. Thank you kindly, friend. On top of everything else, Stammering, an English person being stubborn? Such a thing is unheard of! <laughs> what can I say? I, uh, I have acquired bad uh, bad habits from across the world. One of them being Yenna. Pizza power! Yo! <laughs> Ross, you fucking legend! <laughs> okay. I didn't share the poll so the arguments would start now. But it appears it has begun, and I can't... Uh, firstly, apparently, no one apart from me loves Raphael. So that's shenanigans. Uh, but friends, yeah, um... Ross just donated $10 to the Tiltify campaign. Now, I should say, people will be able to change Turtle via donations while we're live. So we probably won't stick with... We won't be with that Turtle for very long. Once the game gets going proper. So this probably is more, which is the best Turtle? Or I'll take some of the turtle graphics and those will be the ones on screen for the overlay. Um, but yeah, today's game is called Maze. And it is... Different? <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole experience. So, I hope you like your corn uh, vocal and slightly unsettling. Katros, pretty sure April O'Neil is the best turtle. <laughs> That's a funny way to say Casey Jones. Uh, also, friends, um, not that you needed me to tell you, but the first Turtles movie, the live action one, is still a great movie. The rest, sadly. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Captain Steph is uh, seriously afraid of cornfields. Okay. Well, we're not starting for a little bit. Um, but if you need to tap out Captain Steph, I will entirely understand. <laughs> yeah, numbers. How oh, is it Conseco Bat? Please tell me you didn't pay money for this. God, it's so good. Uh, Castro says, My only Turtles exposure was the 2003 cartoon, which they did enjoy. Well, it was, it was impossible. I mean, I was born in 85, so like, I was just at the right age for Turtle Mania. Even though in the UK, censorship boards were so worried about the impact that turtles would have on children, they're hero turtles in the UK, not ninja turtles. And I'm not even joking. I'm not even joking. They did a re-record of the uh, intro and everything, which is almost identical. Um, God. So yeah, no. Um, the turtles was just like that. It was probably where that early setup to, to weeb obsession would come in with was like samurai pizza cats um turtles and some of the other kind of like uh 
semi-translated shows that uh, Saban was putting out back in the day. Yeah, Power Rangers, I was right up for that one because I had mechs in as well. Transformers. So it's probably no shock that I ended up becoming like a monstrous, monstrous weeb. And I still have a massive love of like Animu and I mean, the Gundam collection speaks for itself. Yeah, numbers are ah, the awful 90s dubs. But finding out some of those 90s dubs were actually really good, but are currently buried in legal hell. That was a, a great and sad moment. Uh, wait, which thing, which thing, Fiona? Because I will make sure to <laughs> mention it slightly less. Not entirely less, but slightly less. Um, uh, also, friends, uh, there's been a, uh, there's a wonderful show on YouTube called Toy Galaxy that, admittedly, it's not more about the heart, it's about the business of a lot of those, like, cartoons turn toy lines and what happened to them and samurai pizza cats is fascinating absolutely fascinating uh, and sadly numbers i uh, i i i couldn't uh, i can't disagree with you there like that first season of digimon the dub was uh, needs more time in the oven. But I couldn't understand why it happened because they were basically chasing... Um, they were chasing a craze that had gotten away from them. Oh, sorry, if you don't know, like... Uh, sorry, I'm just going to recommend you YouTube videos today. That's what we're doing. Uh, Polygon did an incredible video called... Um, uh, what if Digimon won? So the idea of what if the, the Digimon franchise had overtaken Pokemon... Because, like, Digimon comes from Tamagotchi, Tamagotchi predates Pokemon, and so while the Tamagotchi had been part of an initial craze, that craze had come and gone, whereas, like, mean, Pokemon, Pokemon exists today as a force of nature. Like, Tepigs be praised, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So one of the interesting things is that um, when Pokemon exploded, there was this potential for other franchises to leap on. And so the Western expansion of Digimon as a brand was done very, very quickly. Um, which is understandable, you know? It's also worth... Because we talked about this the other day, about like the emotional impact of this stuff. Like... It's entirely fine to genuinely love this stuff and understand the business reasons. Oh yeah, well, and numbers... Like, Digimon didn't do so poorly as to keel over and die, like uh, Monster Rancher or some of the other uh, would-be contenders. And we still got some incredible stuff from Digimon. So I'm still happy about that. But no, sorry. The thing that I wanted to mention is, and this will come up a lot with stuff like Turtles and discussion around a load of those 80s cartoons, is that they were made to sell us stuff, <laughs> right? The cartoon was essentially part of an aggressive marketing campaign targeted at us, us weans, to make us want to buy, you know, the Turtles van, which is awesome, and the Turtle Copter, which I always wanted and never got, which, looking back at it now, probably not as cool as I thought it was when I was a kid, but that's another story. Uh, and we talked a lot about this the other week when we were talking about Transformers and Transformers the movie, which was designed to basically wipe the slate clean of the G1 Transformer designs and introduce a new line of toys as part of a big multimedia campaign. The reason I like talking about this is because something can simultaneously be a marketed product designed to sell things and make money and still have a grand emotional impact on us as people. Pokemon is simultaneously a massive part of nerd culture and incredibly important to all of us as it is a multi-billion dollar franchise with planes. There is a Pikachu plane, right? Uh, Catros said, did it work? Never watched Transformers. Um... Sort of. Um, they try. Uh, the interesting thing was that um, 
the character they tried to replace Optimus Prime with was one of those like marketing decisions that did not land with kids. Like, Hot Rod was okay, but Rodimus Prime can feckin' do one. Like, Optimus Prime was iconic and, you know, a bastion of, of, of a bastion of light. Whereas Hot Rod was kind of like the, the Skyver that could. And he had a human companion who was a little gobshite. The, what was meant to be the surrogate character for us ended up being just an obnoxious child who got everything with no need to work for it. Yeah, Numbers saying, uh, that's a very good point. Super Sentai and Kamen Rider are very much the same way. Like, they exist to sell toys. And, well, we don't really talk about Kamen Rider as much because the Power Rangers... We got the Power Rangers over here, but we never really got that... Um, the same treatment with Kaiman Rider, but it's huge. Every year there is a new set of Kaiman uh, of riders with new and cool powers. And once you start looking into it, like they have video game Kaiman Rider characters, it's feckin' grand. Anyway, it's like how we talk about video games. And we were talking about this earlier with World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XIV. We can simultaneously talk about the emotional impact of these games to ourselves and what they mean, but also acknowledge them as a business, like, as a profession. You know? The... In my humble opinion, the goal of professional video games, not from a hobbyist standpoint, but video games as a business, is to create a sustainable environment where you can make the kind of games that you want to. In my mind, Supergiant is the exact pinnacle of what a video games company can be. They make the titles they want to, and they can turn over enough product to keep the studio making what it makes. They expand slowly, but only in mind with what they wish to create. I don't consider the money and the games that get the most amount of fiscal turnaround to be the biggest successes because after a certain point you have to start making choices that are beyond beyond the scope now this is my opinion i would love it if your video game sells 10 million copies and you end up with an inordinate amount of money i will be genuinely happy for you and if you make artistic decisions that allow you to sell 10 million copies rather than 10,000 copies I can't begrudge anyone that. You know what I mean? You can make a game that sells inordinate amounts that still has great emotional impact. Like, look, okay. <laughs> Shenis McDungus. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. <laughs> Not a thing I thought I'd be saying out loud today. Um, but no, so, in, in the background, I've got Mario and Chill on. Like, Nintendo's core IP franchises sell millions they are not small and yet they still have an incredible emotional impact on all of us like zelda is a mainstream franchise and yet it feels personal do you know what i mean so there's loads of ways that one can look at all this finding a balance between the commercial and the artistic that's the that's the the meta challenge of all of this right because I see things... Um, I don't know if you all saw... Uh, Ubisoft have announced a new Tom Clancy shooter that... I don't know what they're trying to go for. Um, it's an FPS, high speed, but it's this weird, like, acid-soaked Tony Hawk's Underground art style, but with the Tom Clancy brand, a brand synonymous for, like, stodgy, like pseudo milsim very much like pro military industrial complex experience and the two do not fit and oh sorry i, I just i saw kybel saying that their mum told me uh kybel's mum told her she wished she'd made zelda so she could play it yes making a game like alien isolation is great but it's not what you want your map to be playing. <laughs> Jim plays. All I heard was 360 kickflip door scorp. Yeah, Alnis. Oh, yes. Tom Clancy, the famous punk aesthetic skater author. And much like Rodimus Prime, some of these concepts do feel like they're cooked up 
in a lab. Now, I know that's not the case. Video game developers work their feckin' faces off to make games. Nobody gets into games because they want to make a quick buck, you know? People get into publishing because they want to make a quick buck, but that's another story. Um, however... Sometimes these things can come across as, as cynical and disconnected. And I don't know, like, that's definitely what I'm getting with... I can't remember the name of this feckin', uh, this feckin' Tom Clancy game. Moose says it's got like an imposed from high kind of feeling. Yeah, not. I'm not usually a Simpsons quoter, but it feels very uh, Poochie the dog. And the reason why I wanted to to talk about this, um, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this uh, is because. When we mentioned the Rodimus Prime thing, that was very much where that ended up coming from. Um, Rodimus Prime was designed to be as aggressive a toy as possible. Like, there was meant to be a human companion, which we, the audience, were meant to consider to be our, um, our, our POV character. Didn't work. Kid was a little gobshite, nobody liked him. Um, like, Hot Rod is meant to be cool and edgy and like resonate with the kids. But then he gets the power of the Matrix of Light and then he's like Rodimus Prime. So now he's a Hot Rod with the back of a truck. And the character of Hot Rod is very much perceived as not really being invested but kind of thrown into it. Which, I mean, could be an interesting deconstruction but did not land when against Optimus Prime. And I know... Um, Ultra Magnus was a great example of like the individual that believes they deserve power and Hot Rod's meant to be the, the cool kid that has power thrust upon him but yeah Alanis is exactly right, kids can smell when something is off or forced now the irony of that being that with a lot of those ideas that resonated with children were kind of like He-Man's the best example sorry, we're just talking about toys now congratulations, we're a toy channel <laughs> Uh, you all know this, so I'm just kind of covering it for conversation's sake, but large proportions of the designs that have become iconic for He-Man were created out of, like, out of business challenges. The fact that he has Battle Cat was because they had a bunch of leftover molds of giant cats from, I believe, as, uh, like a Lion Tamer set that didn't sell. Uh, and the repaint was to give it kind of like that fantasy cover art kind of feel. Numbers is like, remember they made a 10 year old into a Power Ranger? I try and forget about that because there's so many, there's so many things that my brain does not want to process. Oh, okay. Um, so, Katros, I definitely would recommend uh, a series called The Toys That Made Us or Toy Galaxy over on YouTube for a better look into this. But um, He Man was part of like Mattel's. Um, golden age essentially when they were the toy line um and a large proportion of the designs from he-man were just people coming up with either cool designs and belting them out or like actual business challenges that they faced there wasn't like a grand series of um you know he-man comics that existed that were then transferred into a toy range they were just like Let's, have, let's, let's make it happen. Oh, God. Sorry, Jackie Fox mentioning uh, Action Man. Feckin' Action Man. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Action Man was a rebrand of G.I. Joe figures for the United Kingdom. Uh, they were the larger doll-sized ones, not the, the tiny um, plastic ones. And the idea was basically to take that same toy line, but sell it to people that didn't grow up in the... Um, uh, in uh, North America. Had like a bunch of TV shows and stuff. But the thing was, in the UK, we had Thunderbirds, we had Captain Beck and Scarlet, so no offense, but like, nothing G.I. Joe had will ever be as cool as Thunderbird 2. Just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs>
Uh, Catch was saying all they know about He-Man was the intro song that was a banger without narration. Yeah, there was a whole squad of people making these, um, like these, essentially TV commercials for toys. Like they had a squad of people, and like, uh, why so many of those like '80s theme songs were bangers is because it was the same like little, like little troop of um, artists banging out these cracking introductions. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned Thunderbirds. But Thunderbirds came out of a weird part in the UK, which was, um, oh god, is it something Anderson? Is it Jerry Anderson? Uh, was a British production company that specialized in um, puppet-based TV shows, primarily for kids, but they would use miniature scale models for like vehicles and sets. They did some live action shows as well, like Space 1999. Jerry Anderson. Thank you, Wraith. But we're, we're getting wildly off topic. I will say though, if you're interested in the, um, the kind of like, the retro future aesthetic, uh, Jerry Anderson's work, just from a visual standpoint, is incredible. and It's definitely worth having a look. Yeah, and see, now, admittedly, it was for old telly with, you know, 3x4 and terrible quality, but the thing they would do is they'd have the puppets moving around, and then whenever the puppets would interact, they'd cut, cut someone with actual hands, like, doing the manipulations and stuff. God, it was terrible. Oh, okay, and sorry. For those that don't know, like, Thunderbird 2 was one of the best examples of like practical miniatures that we got back in the day it was a multi-function like carrier jet and it would pick up a different uh, body section based on which survival mission they were going on so it could be a submarine it could be a drill it could be a bunch of other stuff yeah uh yeah um fred jerry antifin's ufo was the weirdest super upbeat themes for a grim show right and definitely one of the big influences on early XCOM. sorry we're going just down a weird tangent route here i hope that's okay uh and yeah stammering gamer i do agree like captain scarlet was a great underrated show it did a wonderful job of doing the um uh the threat from the beyond in a future setting now the thing with Captain Scarlet is it's Captain Scarlet versus the Mysterons, represented by essentially two CDs of light being reflected onto characters. But we're never really sure who the Mysterons are or how they operate. What we know is that they find people, take over their bodies and control them. And they have like sleeper agents. So like Agent Black was one of the, uh, the oh, what were they called? It wasn't Rainbow, it was Spectrum. He's one of the agents of Spectrum, and he is taken over by the Mysterons. But it's never explained how they really take it over. Like, visually, you can understand it, but they never sit down and, like, take you through the process. Captain Scarlet was almost taken by the Mysterons, but was left half in, half out, and now he can never die. So, yeah, when you say it out like that, like, it's a pretty one-sided fist fight. Um, but the idea of the Mysterons is this alien invading force that like takes over people's minds and tries to get them to do varying evil things and it's a great example of yeah the the threat of the unknown but in a sci-fi setting as opposed to anything that's derivative of the the lovecraft mythos works which is all kind of like um you know pre-world war one um like north america <laughs> yeah numbers it is not okay. How dare you talk about 80s kid shows? How very dare. Oh yeah, and Stammering Gamer, I would absolutely say like, I also love all of the, um, like the stop motion stuff that we've gotten. Um, it's also worth saying that they used a lot of techniques that are famous in movies like Blade Runner and Star Wars, but they managed to achieve it on a much, much smaller budget, which is something that I always found very impressive. Well, and see, Compliment Cat, this is the thing that I wanted to talk about, is I do... I am not a child psychologist. I can't talk about 
like how advertising affects children in a direct manner because I can only tell you my own personal experiences tangentially. I don't know, right? But I can say that while a large proportion of the media that we consumed during the mid to late 80s, um, early 90s and onwards was mostly through the premise of toys, or at very least, toys were being were considered at the conceptual stages. You know, I'd rave about Reboot and how good that was, but that had a full range of toy lines. Um, however, if we... I don't know where it is right now, but if I was to put on the Arty Farty Beret, we can talk about the emotional impact of these shows. We can talk about how they have inspired us moving forward. Um, one of the great things about He-Man is how it's so unabashedly... I'm just going to say it, forgive my swears. It's, it's batshit Fruit Loops. You've got... You've got a leather daddy riding a green tiger with a sword fighting skeletal face man. But He-Man lives in Skull Mountain, and the skeletal guy lives in a giant snake that's also a mountain. The whole cast of characters has no cohesive through line at all. Like, man-at-arms with super laser shooty gun bangs. Um, mecha neck. What's his deal? It's got a neck that pops out. They created a large amount of these characters to have gimmicks within the toys. However, Especially if you look at the trailers for the new He-Man as it's coming out, it's glorious. They've taken all of those characters and taken a step back and gone, what, to, what is a world where all of these people like live and work and fight and die together? What does this actually look like? And there's something incredible about that. I guess what I'm saying is, whilst the media was, was created to just shift product, the lasting impact it has has been powerful and emotional. Like, I know I keep bringing it back to like, like Transformers and things like that, but you know, the death of Optimus Prime, the reminder that you can do the right thing and you can fight. And sometimes that's still not enough. Like, feckin' yo. Yeah, Alnus, She-Ra, feckin' yes. And the thing is, Shira was an attempt to hit the girls' toy market. Like that that were it. <laughs> you know? Mattel were like, yeah, we're selling loads of He-Man to boys. What if we did like He-Man but for girls? And okay. The other thing that I don't um wanna dismiss, but also I don't wanna um aggrandize is how especially 80s and 90s toys, and I guess to an extent even to this day, is they're very much, they still live in the whole like, blue camp, pink camp. Like there are two styles of toys you make. You make the blue toys or the pink toys, and they have drastically different design philosophies and yeah. That's a whole nother kettle of monkeys and definitely one that I don't wanna jump into today. I will say though, if you wanna feel good, watch uh, again the toys that made us watch the episode on my little pony because and what i love is that even the guys at the time are the ones admitting this is that all the blokes at mattel tried to design a range of horses and they all failed and repeatedly were told by their female co-workers no you need to do it like this they ignored it and failed and it wasn't until the t like a team inside mattel was just given control of that uh, which was staffed by ladies that they went no this is what this is what little girls want as a toy again not going into the gendered natures of kids toys anyway pulling it back pulling it back uh harmonious was saying the comment made me think about the overlap in themes like lovecrafty and stuff and aliens oh yes perhaps best summed up as an encounter with which not does an encounter with that which does not care about you yes it's something that... Uh, sorry, Kimeball, you're going to get some compliments here. It's something that Alien Isolation did very well. Not just that the alien doesn't care about you, but that there is a process and an ecosystem. There is... You're seeing a small part of something much larger than humanity that does not care about you. It does not care to explain itself. It doesn't give a hot diggity. And I really like that. What I really enjoyed about the concept of Captain Scarlet is that you only ever glance the Mister on 
the Mr. On Homeworld from a distance. They are unknowable, but they affect us. <laughs> oh, Captain Steph, don't worry about it. To be continued in Alien Isolation 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> oh, uh, Ross, um, have wonderful sleeps, friend, and thank you for the, the conversation. I know we're starting the game a little bit late, but uh, Captain Steph, uh, Captain Steph said she was afraid of um, Cornfield, so I'm dragging the Waffle Mancy out a little bit more because that way I won't feel so bad when we have to get into the weird Kika. Watto and welcome. How are you doing, friend? Uh, we are talking about. Um, weirdly, we got onto the subject of the emotional impacts of kids' TV. So, yeah. I should also say there is a certain amount of survivor bias when it comes to talking about these, um, like, cartoon franchises. Again, there's nothing that I can tell you that you wouldn't get from, like, sitting down and watching Toy Galaxy or stuff like that. And I do recommend that show because it's been one of the ones that I've watched throughout lockdown to, like, help with sleep and stuff like that. Um, one of the interesting ones was Brave Star, which tried to do so much right and yet did so much wrong simultaneously um Salen saying that their favorite of all time will be Transformers the movie created purely out of a cynical crash grab to murder everyone's favorite character and yet managed to result in a movie that's actually a good movie yeah it's incredible I mean feckin' hell the fact that even the concept of Unicron was of opulence of toy sets. Um, now, again, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, so please don't take this as gospel. But when creating a line of children's toys, what you do is you have a bell curve of price, right? So you start with, here is, a, here is the figure that people want, right? So if it was the turtles, the four turtles are the start of the baseline of your bell curve. And the idea is that, you know, kids will get their favorite and then they'll want something to go with it. So you need to have like a line. So that's where the turtles would have like motorbikes or hang gliders. Mid-tier price point vehicles and accessories for the thing they already got. Villains were also part of that. There's this weird thing where toy lines without villains don't sell, but villains are also the lowest selling part in most toy lines go figure the top the top of the bell curve is the is the play set right this is your um oh what's it metroplex i think was the transformers one for turtles it was the technodrome um and the idea was that for transformers the movie Unicron was going to be the big ticket item. Hundreds of dollars. It is both a playset and a Transformer. And so they came up with the biggest Transformer. One the size of a planet. They basically ripped off the Death Star and gave it, like, uh, uh, Orson Welles' voice. But it resulted in a truly cosmic horror. Like, up until that point, like, the Transformers was good guys versus bad guys you know one wanted to conquer the other one wanted to protect like there's no ambiguity in the early g1 transformers to who's good and who's evil right but then unicron's this whole other thing unicron doesn't give a hot feck about these two warring factions unicron eats planets whole ass planets that's dinner right <laughs> that's some serious like cosmic horror fuckery being laid on children and the concept comes from, well, this was the biggest toy we can make. Yeah, numbers, yeah. Unicron's basically like, you know, Galactus with a fancy voice. Oh, Salem just making an off, uh, just an additional comment that how many of those things they've been able to score at bottom dollar via garage sales. Castle Grayskull, Cat's Lair, Secretus Hive. I don't know that last one.
Yeah, and again, not just a fancy voice. Orson Welles' last role was Unicron. Leonard Nimoy was bloody in the cast of that. Yeah. Um, now... Uh, one thing I've noticed, Jackie, because Jackie was saying that kids shows are made for adults. Prove me wrong. Well, I, I don't know that was more meant as a joke comment, but I think it's an interesting thing where there are a lot of cartoons that you can look back on and go, wow, okay, those were jokes and references that I did not get as a child. And this is my personal interpretation that I really do choose to believe that the shows where the team was having a good time and they were able to sneak in jokes that they found funny that didn't proc the censors, I think is an indication that the team making them were having a great time. Um, now again, I keep referencing Reboot, but that is a great example because that was made specifically for Canadian children's television. However, it had references to like the X-Files in it and... Oh God, okay, now I'm going blank. Good work, Will. Good work. Um... And I, I choose to believe on a lot of those that it's the idea that while the target audience is children, if you really love what you're working on, you're essentially, you're pouring some of yourself into it. Now, <laughs> Cam Steph said, why not parents, let's watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I don't know, but... I will admit seeing uh, Doc Emmett Brown's eyes pop out of his skull was a haunting visage that it took many, many years to get over. You're right, um, Salem, those sectars are weird. Uh, I was a big fan of the, uh, what are they called, visionaries? The like medieval future knights with like the different holograph banners. I had one of the, the comic annuals on it. I think about that a lot. Oh, Satan had a lot of visionaries. Oh, well, so there was one comic that was in the uh, visionaries annual that somehow I got given as a kid. I don't know. And I think about it a lot because uh, the story of how they got their powers is that everyone is lured to this huge temple, massive temple, like a tiny city, for the promise of like riches, power, magic, whatever. There's a, there's a wizard. He's being an asshole, if I remember rightly. And so everyone joins the hunt for the great treasure for different reasons. But little do they know, their actions throughout this, this dungeon run challenge, this temple full of traps and puzzles and whatnot, that their behavior inside the temple will denote their power. You know, those who were predatory and vicious get like, you know, heartless, heartless beasts and monsters. You know, those who were, you know, selfless and kind end up on the good guys and get like, you know, symbols of hope and whatnot. Those who were cowards got like little mice and stuff. And I've thought about that concept a lot. It goes back to the machine learning conversation we were having a couple weeks back about how I would love to have games that react to players' playstyle and judge them based on that. But that's another story. Uh, Wolfcrowder says they can absolutely picture some director being like, okay, this is a cash trail. So let's make it the best damn cash grab ever and go nuts. I mean, you can say a lot about the Transformers movie, but you can't say that it was, it was unloved. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel cynical in its delivery. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry, I find this, and I find this stuff fascinating. See, in video games, we've actually had it a little bit better than people with cartoons. Because, again, like, let, I'm going to pick on Nintendo today, because I've just, we're listening to, like, Nintendo and chill and whatnot. But a large proportion of Nintendo's early product was designed to sell, right? The, from the way it was marketed to the kinds of titles they decided to commission, and... What was lovely was that, you know, Miyamoto in the original, like, wave of 
Nintendo creatives put heart and thought into it. But again, they were products. Uh, Thaka rules, Watto. Eagle lives, Watto, friend. Uh, I would love to... Uh, Well, <laughs> uh, Eagle lives. Why, well, friend? I would also love to beat Starscream to death with his own leg. Although I did see someone making, uh, I I won't go too deep into this thought because I would highly recommend watching uh, the Loki series if you get the opportunity as it's been put out. But a parallel between um, Starscream and Loki is something that I find very curious. Like Starscream being the person who who wishes for power but has no ability to rule. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, what was I nattering on about? Oh yes, we've had the opportunity in video games to see this kind of um, evolution on toys ads. Um, okay, for those of you who don't know, Nintendo basically brought us back from the brink. Now, I'm not, I don't think we wouldn't have gotten PC gaming as a thing, but in terms of video games as the industry it is today, like, for those of you who don't know, like, the big Atari crash was more akin to toys than it is to video games as we see them now. For those who don't know, like, Atari had massive success with home consoles and cartridges. So everybody else in the toy industry, or at least in the a combination of toys and um, technology, treated it in the same manner. They all came up with a console. They all came up with a bunch of cartridges. Like the sheer number of different ones is mind boggling. So the market floods with low, low tier product, kids moved on. Like kids didn't care about Atari anymore. The market had been flooded. It was no different than like any other like must-have Christmas toy. Then we got Nintendo. Oh, down on Dwarf Watto. Um, then we got Nintendo, which refocused their marketing efforts and pushed a very, very curated product line along with home console entertainment, which ended up sweeping the feckin' um, uh, the... I can only speak really for the English language territories, but yeah, it did gangbusters. Now, the reason I'm going off on this tangent is that like... Games like um, Zelda, Mario Brothers, etc. These were... These were products. The fact that Miyamoto and the team at Nintendo, I don't want to attribute it all to one person, but that first wave of Nintendo creatives that came out with products for the NES, they put a lot of heart and a lot of thought into the concept. But first and foremost, this was a physical, these were physical cartridges to sell to children to make money. And so a lot of them were very simplistic, very weird, um, that visually fit different demographics. But, you know, there was a fantasy game. There was a, you know, there was a mascot jumping game. Um, there was, I believe there's like racing. I guess Duck Hunt was kind of the, the, the quirky different one. And if you're wondering where I'm driving this tangent, don't worry, we have a destination in mind. It's not Wendy's. Um, what we've been able to see is because of the manner in which we sequelize games in our industry, we've been able to see these concepts like grown and advanced and thought through. Like the different reimaginings of um, the Zelda franchise, the different ways in which we've seen Link is utterly fascinating because people have been able to take different cracks of the character and have been able to evoke the experiences that those early games brought up in us. Am I going am I going too weird? I might I might have gone too weird. Alright, tell me if I've gone off the, the deep end here. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, compliment caps just going through the uh, the unicorn rabbit uh, the unicorn rabbit hole at the moment. Yup. God, it's just it's the fascinating thing that um, 
Unicron converts Megatron when is he he's at his uh, he's at his absolute lowest you know betrayed thrown into the void uh, and it's Unicron that takes him and reshapes him as a cannon um, also the parallels between the death of Optimus Prime and the death of um, of Megatron again so brilliant because they're killing off all the old cast of characters. Both of them have got to go. But, like, Megatron's dying, and so Starscream's like, goodbye, Felicia, just floats his corp... Well, his soon-to-be corpse into space and then takes power. And when the passing of Optimus Prime, it's all of the Autobots around his side, like, sobbing. And if you're the child, probably also sobbing as well. <laughs> Two... Another name I didn't think I'd say out loud. Cheese Sleeves. <laughs> Wato and welcome. Um, we're talking about... I guess we're talking about how... <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're a child. Still gets me sometimes, Sadler. Still gets me. Um, we're talking about, like, products created for children to make money that end up having big emotional impacts. Yeah. And I'm not saying that um, we don't have these kind of like impactful performances today. It's just, it's a curious one because like things like Transformers and the Ilk came out of a time when the industry was just trying to sell toys. And yet there's so much. Uh, and sorry, if you're wondering what got us onto this conversation topic, uh, I'm doing a charity event this Saturday and I'm going to play this game, which if you know it, you'll know it's a bastard. And you're going to be able to mess with me in real time. And I wanted to talk about... Now, the Turtles is a slightly different one because the Turtles actually came from a satirical cartoon that ended up being converted into a children's franchise that ended up taking over the world. So, it's kind of... It's fascinating when you hear about the products that were in themselves... Um, original IPs that became children's toy lines. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, Bucky O'Hare is another one. Uh, Bucky O'Hare was like an anti-capitalist sci-fi comic that got turned into a kid's cartoon show with toys. Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, Tharko, uh, yeah, the early uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics were brutal. Sleeves, thank you for the follow, all the same. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to laugh at your name. Um, sorry. Oh, yes, uh, Jafar Jeff, yeah, the Decepticons, you're dead if you're useless. Well, it's also this thing of, like, Megatron ruled through fear. The reason why Starscream didn't just stab him in the back was because Starscream was kind of like, but what if I miss? You know? So, when Megatron is... When Megatron is there dying, maybe they'd be able to fix him up. Maybe they'll be able to heal him. But everyone he's trodden on, everyone he's demeaned and uh, ruled with fear suddenly turns on him like a pack of hyenas. <laughs> uh, Taka Rule says, to be fair, my name... To be fair! Uh, my name is meant to evoke a reaction in D&D players. I am woefully behind on the Adventure Zone. Uh, though I did watch uh, Sarah J's, uh, Sarah Z's um, catch up on that one, so it was very interesting. Yeah, and Alanis, feckin' yo. Uh, if you ever wondered why the Turtles fight the Foot Clan, it's because the OG comic had like a piss take of Daredevil, and Daredevil fights the hand, so the Turtles fight the foot. <laughs> Oh, okay, Stu just saying, so Tharko is, uh, Tarko is from second before. I didn't know that. There we go, see, I'm learning. Reactor online, sensors online, weapons online, all systems nominal. What ho 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 happy shark mass. You see that, Favor 6? That's me staring at you. <laughs> but Favor 6. Thank you kindly for 21 months. That's fecking cool of you. 
uh, even if you did use that 21 month alert to be a jerk. Um, but yeah. Okay. Happy It's not a real, no, no. J-Post, I would not acknowledge this. Thank you kindly for 200 bits, which will keep me alive, but no. Um, uh, sorry, so yeah, uh, to Thaka rules, uh, I didn't actually know that was where your stuff came from. I assumed it was from the Adventure Zone. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's. I should put my hand up and say that while I've been into tabletop gaming for, a, uh, sorry, tabletop roleplay for a long time, I was one of those elitist jerks back in the day who was like, uh, D&D's for nerds. I play Vampire the Masquerade, which is for cool people who are cool. I was one of those. And it took me a long time to get over my uh, my stupid self-imposed personal bias. Um, but weirdly, like, um, I am glad that, I mean, I'm very glad that I did. Oh, so Stooge says it was because back in the day, your AC got lower rather than larger, which we can all agree is counterintuitive, right? You'd think less armor bad. Kaimul, why would you do this? Chrono Fire Watto. Stammering Gamer, I'm not looking at that. You can't make me. <laughs> and Thaka's like, and now they play Vampire on Tuesday. Like, yo. It's... I just... I was a young teen trying desperately to be uh, any kind of modicum of interesting in a in a world of banality, and so I adopted a lot of like nerd elitisms, which I'm glad I got out of the habit of. The truth is, like every tabletop system has its has its strengths and weaknesses. Like each of the D and D variants has some stuff it does great and some stuff it does poorly, but it's about the people around the table. Like one of my favorite campaigns that I have ever played was in 4th edition. Bloody 4th edition, which I can understand why everybody dislikes. Do you know what I mean? Oh, and Final Phoenix. What's ho, friend? So, friendos, I want to keep nattering and hanging out with you lot for a bit longer, but we are going to be playing a game. Uh, the reason why we haven't started just yet is because uh, Captain Steph is afraid of cornfields, and we're about to play a game about sentient corn. It's gonna be weird. Uh, jumping back into chat. Uh, oh, Gil! What, ho, friend? How you doing? Um, oh, Phil is saying that they loved the, the Bloodline 2 box art. When did Rami become a vampire? I was at the event where I'm being like, Yo, Rami, are you in GD? Are you in San Francisco? <laughs> also not surprised that Rami's a vampire. Um... Okay, Sadlin, I've never had the chance to watch the Vampire the Masquerade TV show. I've grown up with its knowledge, but never access to it. Like, maybe we can do what we did, like, with Battle Tecmus, where we just, where we find a place that we can watch it and just get trashed. Oh, wow. I mean, Gil, I hope it's for, for good and not ill. Uh, Gil's saying they're about to start working 12-hour uh, shifts. Feckin' yo. All right, well... Um, the only big thing I've got going on at the moment, Gil, is this Saturday we're doing a charity event. Uh, I'm going to play this bastard of a game, and the longship are going to try and sabotage me finishing it. It is me versus the turtles. <laughs> Sadlin saying, I bet many dollars, Tepix, that Kindred is a pretty rough watch these days. Yeah. Okay, but I love the idea, and this is completely Will's headcanon, this is not real at all, but in the same way that the Battletech cartoon is part of the Battletech universe, I love the idea that the Vampire the Masquerade TV show exists inside the world of darkness as like a wormhole extreme X, like a group of kindred funding a terrible TV show about vampires to disprove the existence of vampires. <laughs> Oh, Thaco says it is. They watched it a few months ago. Yep. Yep. 
And Moose, you're right. Things that are a rough watch can be great with the longship riff tracks. Yeah, the feckin... Okay, sorry. If you're wondering what Battle Techmas was, uh, I believe it was last either November or December, we all sat down and rewatched the Battletech Saturday morning cartoon. Um, for those who don't know, um, Battletech or MechWarrior, they attempted to turn it into a kid's toy range when back when Fassacorp was still massive. And it's like a hyper over the top pile of nonsense based around the clan invasion. And it has like rudimentary early 3D graphics, um, terrible, terrible animation in parts and a bunch of really good voice actors just chewing the scenery. And it's glorious. It's feckin' glorious. Yeah, uh, Daka rules. That's what I was saying, yeah. Uh, Wormhole Extreme. Or is it Wormhole X Extreme or what have you? That comes from Stargate SG-1. And it's one of my favorite, favorite concepts. What they do is to avoid information of the Stargate leaking out and gaining traction, they produce this budget-ass knockoff of their exploits called Wormhole Extreme. So that if anybody starts hearing about wormholes or people from another planet or what have you, the American government can point to the show and be like, I don't know, that's just from this TV show. <laughs> Oh, Ems, thank you kindly. We just, we got talking about the impact of kids' cartoons on artistically and how a lot of those cartoons were just designed to sell us toys or make us want, make us annoy our parents to buy us toys. And yet the actual cartoons themselves ended up having a lasting impact. So yeah. Uh, and then, so Ems, uh, when you re uh, as you've come back, we're talking about the Vampire the Masquerade TV show from years, years back, which I still haven't seen, but I love the idea that it actually exists in the world of darkness as a plausible deniability show. Oh, Adam, what ho, friend? We're just having a big old natter. Uh, but yeah, so friends, we'll probably do Battle Techmas again round about winter, because honestly, one, it was hilarious to get drunk, and inflict the Battletech cartoon on people. Plus, I've now got the opening scroll on my phone, so I can play it whenever I want. Uh, Ems was adding that uh, half the, uh, the CN shows? Sorry, friends. So, Favor6 says they forgot the email address from the trolling account. What Favor6 means is that they will... They have been... I, I think they're one of the uh, the throws bits via third-party accounts just to mess with me sideways. Is it really trolling if you are... Well, I guess it does make me go... <sighs> but via the medium of keeping me alive. I don't know. It's a curious philosophical kind of question. Oh, Lyris. Lurk away, friend. Cheers to you. <laughs> yeah, numbers, you're right. We are nearing, nearing nearly uh, two hours of Waffle Mancy. But I can't imagine anybody else I'd want to spend a couple hours with just nattering along. Okay, and as I did say earlier, friends, like, um, uh, I, uh, we're taking an extra, an extra little bit of time, because I know this game's pretty short, but also that, um, I know there's some peeps that, uh, are genuinely afraid of cornfields, so <laughs> adding sentient talking corn into cornfields isn't going to help anyone. Oh, number says today is, uh, Genshin Impact Day. Oh, lovely! 
That's feckin' grand. Oh, uh, and just while uh, Gil and Peeps are here and those who have returned, um, I'm just going to plug the charity page one more time because uh, it has the schedule of when we're kicking off. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, Catros, you make a very good point. All right. Uh, down under dwarf. Talking corn sounds corny. It's gonna get weird. It's gonna get weird. Now I, I'm I, okay. Touch wood. It's not gonna get like scary weird. It is not a horror game as I understand it. Uh, there is a gruff Russian bear and there is a lot of talking corn. It is a wonderfully surreal title. Oh, I go. Uh, so the person that made the uh, the art for the charity event is uh, Banavalope, who I'm more than happy to link to. Let's grab their see Twitters. Yeah, so that individual that I've just linked in chat, that is the person who made the uh, the art for this one. Oh, excuse me. Please forgive my cheeky tea burps. All right. So who's ready to get weird? CJ, how are you doing, friend? What? Oh, and welcome! Yep. Yeah, I hope you're all ready for some strange nonsense. Because that's where we're going. Right. Without further ado, we are jumping into Maze. Um, just quickly. Maze is a first-person adventure game about what happens when two scientists misinterpret a memo from the US government and create... Sentient corn. And that last sentence is pretty much the least ridiculous thing about this game. <laughs> Stabbing's like, I'm not weird. Neither is my shrine to Danny DeVito. All hail Danny DeVito. All hail. <laughs> Gatos is like, I, I, okay. This is going to get weird. But in my defense, I was thoroughly enjoying talking to all of you. I know, shocking. Shocking that I would enjoy your conversation, friends. Oh, hang on a sec. Oh, God. Okay, we're okay. We're okay. Cheese leaves says they once took mushrooms and looked upon themselves in the mirror for some time. Found they began to look more and more like Danny DeVito. Now, obviously, on this Twitch.television, we would never condone the use of illegal substances in any manner, shape, or form. Um, and I have never consumed psychotropics whilst wrapped in a blanket next to other people wrapped in blankets, whilst watching some of the nicest Studio Ghibli films. And at the warm, happy part... There ain't no weird like an S-Club weird. There is, actually. S-Club kids. The child soldiers of pop music. <laughs> Favor six, thank you kindly for the thousand bits. The Yaldum is yours. What will you do with your newfound power? Oh, hail the new Yarl! 
<laughs> numbers. Yeah, specifically specific denial. Yeah, but I'm going to make sure that one is definitely written off. <laughs> Al, this is like, why would you bring that cursed memory back? For... I am the cursed keeper of the old memes. For those of us that survived Spice World, it didn't end there. Yeah, cheese, uh, cheese's sleeves are saying there's still other Spice Girls. There's nothing wrong with that. But to those of us in the United Kingdom who survived Spice Mania, we saw some Honest, stuff. What can I say except you're welcome? <laughs> what can I say except you're welcome? <laughs> uh, bringing back those gloriously haunted memories. Uh, Vanderbeest, thank you for filling the pint glass. And Favor 6 for 200 on top of that. Like, again... I do want to say a massive thank you, because whether or not you're throwing bits in to troll my dumbass or otherwise, it all goes to keeping us alive here, so thank you. Uh, Gamepad no likey. Okay. Um, individuals of the crew, friends and new friends alike, let us begin. <sighs> Maze. it's not too loud oh and down under dwarf sometimes ignorance is bliss ignorance is bliss you can leave it <laughs> do not cite me the old pop I was there when it was released I was there when it was formed I've seen Jerry Halliwell on fire up the shoulder of Ryan backstreet boys glittering in the darkness Anton Deck like beeps of I'm sorry. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. <laughs> I catch us, yeah, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit having fun, I won't lie. I won't lie. Yeah. <laughs> I witnessed Aaron Carter beat Shaq. No amount of Shaq fool could save him. <laughs> Wraith, no, you're right. They were PJ and Duncan. <sighs> okay. Okay, that's very strange, but let's have a look. All right, cool. Uh, that's not allowed, but all right. Uh, sorry, please bear with me just a second, friends. It is doing some weird nonsense. Hold that thought. Options. Alright. We should be okay. Feckin' God darn it, son of a bad word. 
Alright, sorry, I've got to do some adjustments. Okay, there we go. That'll do for now. Okay, Gil, have a lovely rest of your day. Uh, if you have time on Saturday, the turtles thing, I don't know how it's going to go, but it should at least be very entertaining. So consider yourself cordially invited. Ah, J Crips. What, ho, friend? Yes, you're right. The world of live streaming, where nothing ever goes wrong, and everything works perfectly the first time. Okay, so we had a bit of a, a surreal intro, followed by some corn doing a run past us. This is fine. Uh, I'm Faber6. I'm sorry I missed you, pun friend. I promise it wasn't uh, intentional. Um, things are better. I mean, this game was released in 2016. Um, hey! Stringer, please. What? Oh, oh it's, it's, it's talking corn, you know? Sentient talking corn. Okay. <laughs> uh, and Stringer, please, thank you for messing. You know what? I'm just going to share it with them now. All right. So one of the reasons why I was doing a little bit of Drifty Potato is... So, friendos. Uh, I have just dropped a link in chat. As some of you might have seen, um, and I don't think anyone noticed it was myself, um, I was very, very kindly asked to do some VO work. For packs online i got to do an incredible look around you impression for a bunch of glorious nonsense and stringer please was very did an incredible job making a whole bunch of stuff uh the stuff is now online and you can have a look at it as it might have sneaked a few of you uh, sneaked past a few of your lovely selves uh, i was messaging um stringer please to see if we could put it uh, if i could just play it to you on li uh, live on twitch but some of the music might involve us getting dinged with um, DMCA stuff. So sadly, I can't do a, uh, a viewing party with all of you. But I'm going to drop it here. And I'll drop it over on Discord and all. Oh, and Richter, how are you doing, friend? Oh, yeah. So again, Stringer, please, Laura. Thank you so much for letting me be involved with it. It was feckin' fun. It was feckin' fun. And it's just... I'm genuinely envious of your ability to write funny in the manner that you do. Like, no joke. Oh, Aikoa, um, if you are heading for bed, have a lovely rest of your day. Sleep well. Uh, and sorry, Wato. Yeah, we've uh, and uh, sorry, the game we've literally just started. Uh, and Captain Steph, it's it's nay worry. I mean, this is why we did extra waffle mancy time, because I wanted to hang out with everybody. But yeah, so friendos, the link that I just dropped in there, give it a watch. Um, I am thoroughly, thoroughly looking forward to. Uh, finding out how many people actually spot the weird nonsense I was involved with. And like, um, Stringer please, I was telling people about the, um, the the crab cut and how it took like six takes because I kept laughing at the joke each time. Oh yeah, Nom Nom, I can give you a link again. Boof! 
Um, so yeah. Uh, if you're wondering what in the ruddy hell we're doing, we're playing Maze today. A game of... <laughs> ah. So today is all about the forbidden snack talking back home. It's only forbidden once it's been popped. Up until that point, it's just food. <laughs> oh, don't string it, please. That's lovely of you to say. Uh, I have um, a uh, non-spyware version of Audacity on my system, and I've gotten very good at cutting out those bits where I'm trying to stifle a laugh. Noise reduction plus removal equals good times. Stooge no. Stooge no. Wasabi Chi is like, the Rowan model's just food. It's sturdy food, though. Mildly undigestible. But remember, everything's food once. Uh, I managed to annoy a bunch of geologists, which was fun. Uh, there was a beautiful photo of a lava eruption in Iceland. Of the, the magma spilling over into the, uh, into the ice. And there's a rock formation that looks like a person lying down. And if I... As a wise man once said, once you pop, you can't stop. Okay, firstly, that's Pringles and you know it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Stringer, please. Um, thank you again for letting me get involved with pack stuff. If there's anything I can do for, for real people in world, please just let me know. Um... <laughs> J-Post literally can't stop. <laughs> Wraith, no! We Pringles are not just flat band snack. Hey, Lizzie, what, old friend? Welcome back. How are you, Ruddy Bin? I am very happy to hear your internets have returned. Oh, water go this way. Big ring. I wonder if that's the way we need to go. Uh, Bacon saying, not gonna lie. Ah. <laughs> oh, I mean, I was, I was so excited, and having to sit on it quietly was the hardest thing. Okay, so we've got... Don't have a hand. Don't have a key. Don't have a circle. Alright, so we can't open the bunker just yet. <laughs> Lizzie's like, now I can engage in true pants-free while I work. Same. Same. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm clothed. <laughs> Well, Cheese Sleeps, I hope you know I've always thought the same thing. Because it's supposed to be palm leaf oil, right? But palm oil does not sound like something one should be discussing um, in, a, in a crowded department store. you could say this corn maze is amazing no no uh captain steph it is entirely okay if you need to tap out as i as i was saying that is why we did extra long waffle nancy like i completely understand <laughs> and also okay i have been made to dab once today it was once again humiliating Pressing Q does absolutely nothing. I pushed it anyway, though. 
Low hanging fruit on that pun. Low hanging fruit. Delicious with little effort. Sign me up. A car makes amazing! See, Aperios made the same joke I did. You don't, you don't yell at Aperios. And also, how are you doing, mate? We've talked about toys. We've talked about games. And now we're playing them. Guess we got to check in. All right, what have we got? Left mouse. All right, so item added to folio. Ah, okay, welcome note. A note lazily scribbled includes a stock greeting and encourages the reader to enjoy a complimentary snack on the desk. Note to the reader to mind the boxes. Also says open the big door and will probably say hello. Staring says, have I played this before on stream because I'm getting deja vu? I have not. At least I don't think I have. Huh. I remember there being boxes there. Well, we've enjoyed a complimentary snack. Back in question mark minutes. An English muffin. Hard as granite, this muffin is most definitely nowhere near fit for consumption, despite how much you try. All you've done is given yourself a headache. <laughs> Press E to examine the equipped item. Oh, yeah. And how best to use it. Apparently it's a throwing weapon. Okay, so it can't get through the boxes yet. Mega oranges produced in the US of A. When regular oranges just won't cut it. Mega oranges. Or moranges. No, I regret saying that out loud and I wish I never had. Place the space bar to look forward to your folio. Ah, yes. The welcome note. That way to the door. The statue. You know what? Let's go check out the statue. We can faff around with the house in a second. And... A broken shovel hand. Completely useless for shoveling dirt, but helpful if you wanted to tip something over. You immediately think of the wardrobe on the second floor of the farmhouse, because you didn't particularly like how it looked at you, and it would ruin its day. I, you know what? I feel like I'm getting called out already, because I've... Okay. Fiona... There have been instances where I have been overtly, we'll say brutal, towards inanimate objects. And I'm still sorry about it. Uh, there was a Google... There was a Google thing that we never found the corpse of. Apparently I once snapped a controller in half. And I mean remote, like for the television. Lovely little greenhouse. Kyle saying this is very Douglas Adams. You know what? I agree. The the point and click third person. Oh, open the chicken coop. Aha! Farmhouse key. Lovely. The, the surrealness is giving me a kind of a Starship Titanic kind of vibe. And the manner in which... <laughs> no matter how many times you press it, Q still does nothing. I'll have you know, that sound... Mashing that button. Numbers like, personally, I would not have stepped in there. Ah, uh, yes. But I very rarely think through what I do before I do it. 
a rusty nail jammed into a wall. Okay. A mediocre rock. Oh, the mediocre rock has been added to our folio. Alright. Uh, this rock you found near the outhouse. You don't know why you have it. It, it is absolutely mediocre in every way possible. Its name is Ch it's Chauncey? God. Okay, one more round of cues, but only because you asked very nicely, Cheese. Nothing. <laughs> uh, Orgesina, you're right. We found the pet rock. Now we have company. Alright, well I suppose we should start looking into the farmhouse. This seems fine. Uh, Stammering Game is asking if we can name it Dave. No. We have a Dave. Doors open. We already have a Dave in Subnautica. And I'll... <laughs> I will be very happy if we never meet Dave ever again. Oh, invoice for a carved wooden statue. Um, invoice for a commissioned wooden statue. Uh, the cost is in the hundreds of thousands. Items on the list include chopping down a large oak tree, carved statue out of oak tree, and hospital bills for injuries injury sustained chopping down old oak tree. Now oh, that's haunting. That's exceptionally haunting. Chess boards and old burger wrappers. Uh, Asari is saying, why does this feel like a horror movie? Um, because they're using a lot of like um, structural tropes. We're being shown the corn before we're getting the chance to experience it. Because if you've already, if you bought this game, you're aware of its hook. So they're kind of dangling the hook in front of us. Oh, it's a boring novel. Having no talent at the game, the author mistakenly revealed the murderer's identity on the first page. I spent the rest of the novel outlining the story about a detective buying a pair of pants. <laughs> Night Danger, a Nick Murphy mystery. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I didn't know that the humor in this was gonna be quite as pithy as it is. I'm very okay with this. An old sink. Medicine cabinet with nail clippers. Gross. A bathtub plug. The sink is now plugged. Oh, I guess that was where it's meant to go. I will admit, because this is such a simple environment, the lighting they've baked in is absolutely incredible. Alright, we've got a sausage grinder with something jammed inside. This does have the um, rub item on item until sold. Rancid corn oil. Oh, good. Um. Oh, yes, uh, Iron Imp. Thank you kindly. Uh, Iron Imp was asking about the horror collections that we quite enjoyed, which was the Dreadex collection, which did have a similar kind of like structural vibe. And I think this title is staying just this side of... Oh. I think this title is staying just this side of... Threatening for the potential of future whimsy. Press C to crouch. And again, not to crouch. You can do this forever. 
Aha! A concealed switch. Unlocked a secret door, making it much less secret. Uh, and I'll try using the, the corn oil on the... Nah. Good shout, though. Good shout. Uh, Wraith, I can try pushing Q to see if anything happens. No, it doesn't look like Q does anything. <laughs> uh, Jcrypt's saying, do you think it's going to be logical or Discworld levels of crazy? I'm not sure at the moment. Everything that we're acquiring is semi-logical, but we'll see how this goes. side through the basement. Like, I do know the goal of this game isn't to be a horror game, at least by my understanding. And Faber6 says the room of this game is not quite Discworld level. Okay. I'll still... I mean, I, it's not really a contest. Fuse box is missing a fuse. I'm going to put some nail clippers in there. Um, I will still put forward that Discworld is one of the most moon logic-y point-and-click adventures. But it's not, not that it's a contest, but it's the best example of. Because it's a point-and-click game with some very, very obtuse solutions to very whimsical puzzles. But a large proportion of the time, the solutions don't make sense, even in the context of an existingly strange world. Uh, all of these paintings are haunting. Just straight up haunting. Okay, kid's bedroom packed up. Like, what's that? What's what's the big ring? All right. So what have we got here? A bobby pin. Ah, uh, yes, which, as we know, is incredibly breakable. Thanks, Bethesda. Oh, see, Faber 6, I would disagree. Because as someone who knew Disc who knows Discworld very, very, very well, I found it very difficult to pass what they were putting forward. But that's my personal. And now, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as the text adventure is one of the most difficult games I have come across. And definitely features Moon Logic up the wazoo, but I feel like in point and Moon Logic in text adventures is a different problem. Do you know what I mean? Because it adds the language barrier as well as it's not just like take a, an inventory of items and rub them on one another until so satisfied. It's a giant cue. It does nothing, of course. So we can place the fruit crate here. Okay. Tip the wardrobe over with the broken hand, uh, the broken handle. Now that would be a very moon logicy puzzle. However, they're using a lot of the sarcasm in the writing to describe what we must do next, like. It's okay to create a puzzle game where the puzzles are obvious, so long as you're using them for the right reasons. Again, this is not news. I know you all know this. It's just more the case of like, God, I hate that gnome. God, look at his creepy little eyes. Send that to Thor. Uh, sorry. Having a puzzle game where the puzzles are the challenge and the goal is grand, and having a story game with puzzles used for, for pacing and exploration is also feckin' grand. The problem comes when trying to make one game and creating another by mistake. Ah, uh, you yeah, know, Fred's right. The, the, the Big Ring is part of the legendary parent of the Soul Keys. A tale of souls and keys, eternally retold. Oh, a burnt lab report. Added to the folio. Um, much of it can't be read, but the words 
abject failure appear several times. So does hurt feelings, sentient corn stalks, and why did we do this? <laughs> God, the writing in this is already glorious. Thing is, friends, I've been saving this game because I knew it was going to be a treat, and I'm so glad we're getting to do this together. I don't know if this is the kind of game that is going to be one that people are going to want to play themselves after. But if this does end up being a banger, please consider picking up a copy. If only to support the people creating it, you know what I mean? Alright, so we've got good stuff in jars. Item can be placed. Alright, we do have a mallet. Uh, also, the way the inventory is constructed is it the speed at which we can kind of rub object on object, I am a big fan of. And the ornate chest cannot be opened. Alright, so we get some trouble. Ugh, sentient humans. Fred, that sounds gross. I like weird hairless apes hmm Phyllis I think that's a really good way of putting it um sorry Phyllis was saying so uh <laughs> Innuendo Studios put up a wonderful video where they described adventure games as puzzles with plots. The puzzles are almost unique mechanics and each one is different in some way of every other puzzle in the game. A good way for communicating story beats and gameplay in ways that are more reduced uh, that a more reduced set of gameplay verbs couldn't do so well. I think that's right. Oh, sour keys. Fred, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I killed your joke. There's a Hallmark card that I'd need to buy several of. <laughs> sorry I killed your joke. It also just made me chortle that there's a nail in the bathroom. And what have we got that we could use to pull it out? Nail clippers. And again, sorry, um, the reason why I find these conversations fascinating is that, like, the the leap forward of point-and-click games definitely came from an era where people wanted to do more narrative-heavy cinematic titles, but didn't have the... necessarily the... didn't know the market existed for those, or didn't have the technological means to convey such an experience. Alright. Kaimbal, have excellent sleeps. As always, it's lovely chatting with you. Um, you know, if I I'm sorry you didn't make Zelda, um, my commiserations there. <laughs> Pulled the rusty nail out of the wall with the nail clippers. Uh, Fred was adding, although now I'm looking forward to this bizarre crossover where the weapons Sour Edge and Sour Caliber are the keys to taking junk food street fighting world. There is no other power than Sour. <laughs> Numbers is like, I hate that that worked. And the nail goes in the fuse box because I'm irresponsible. Rusty nail and the fuse. Again, <laughs> you used the soft. <laughs> Use rusty nail as a fuse against safety regulations. Restored power to the farmhouse. It is slightly less dark than it was before. Ah, yes. So going back on the like interactions with the world of like as as Phyllis was putting it like you know the 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 verbs available to the player. So Phyllis is saying so like run, jump, shoot. 
uh, are a great set of verbs for action and platforming games, and you can get a lot of variety from those. You definitely can. But it's the same set of actions resolving every challenge. Also, it's hard to time those. But we'll get onto that in a second. Uh, an adventure game means every challenge is different, and you can have vastly different sets of actions. It enables more granular kinds of storytelling. Um, through gameplays, you can't quite do without them. Why other action games can't stop and have puzzles? Oh, okay, some of those I disagree on, like the you can have puzzles in action games, but the focus is different. Like, as pacing, puzzles can be real good, so long as they're not frustrating. As long as they're not trying to force the user into a new form of language. Like how the puzzles in Half-Life 2 sometimes slap and sometimes don't, but that's not a kettle of monkeys. Um, the thing about the way in which we... Oh, you can have puzzles. Oh, Fearless, I'm so sorry. Uh, I... Apologies there. But yes. Um, the ones that work in Half-Life 2 are definitely the great example of that one. Um, see, this game is funny. It is already going for a, a pithy sarcasm. But that kind of like background... That background snark, while very, very good is difficult to keep consistent. There'll need to be other kinds of humor beats throughout, right? But the problem with humor is timing. Comedy is all about like when the joke drops and how it drops, right? But one of the problems with like run, shoot, run, shoot, punch, explode, etc., is that... Okay, Catros. I, I will admit, my ape storage solutions haven't been ideal, but, you know, it's something that we can work on. Um, the thing about these kinds of solutions is that no matter what it takes to do the thing, you always solve it on a beat, right? You're always in one place when you solve a thing, as opposed to um, things like running, jumping, shooting. We as game creators, it's very difficult for us to control when player do shoot. When does player shoot bad guy? When does player, you know, jump thing? I guess jumping can be useful, but jumping implies a level of movement and freedom, which makes it very difficult to, to flag and trigger things than you would do of just like put key in door. Like if we did, if we take a step back, the disambiguation is we have object. We have, we have object, we have problem. We apply object to problem to get solution. And on the click of the solution, of the, of the click of the lock, we as the creators are in control of the pace in that that in that brief moment so that's when we can deliver humor or comedy to the beat if you know what i mean or if i stop me if <coughs> stop me if i'm dying stop me if i've gone too abstract there because i know i can get into the arty farty of it and again all these classical paintings with like this weird humpty dumpty character as the lead very unsettling. Anyway, it clearly wants us to play with the radio. Open to the CD player. Oh! You are not TCPA player. Good for you. A new path open to you. To the barn and silo. Ooh! Lovely! Barn or silo first? Oh, they're both in the same direction. Okay. J. Crip says they think that Bastion did a great job with triggers, timing, and narrative. Abs are feckin' lootly. Now, this is one of those points where if I say, like, if I say simple, I don't mean bad. Bastion's triggers are placed usually after the death of a bad guy or at certain environmental beats because of the manner in which you traverse the environment, right? So the trigger points are quite simple. But Bastion is able to um, deliver a very, very complex, and very, very evocative narrative. Okay, down under dwarf. Have a lovely rest of your day. <laughs> the Swan Dragon says, "I hear we're talking super giants, and I'm here to simp, respectively." Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you heard my comments earlier, Swan Dragon, but when we were talking about, like, the business versus the artistic of games, 
I still think that Supergiant it is Supergiant is essentially the industry standard. Like that's where I consider a studio to be incredibly successful. That they are able to consistently make the kinds of products they want to with the creativity that they want to. No, I'm not sprinting. I need to talk to people. Um they've that Supergiant has balanced like the need to sell games to make enough money to continue to make games alongside the creative elements of what they wish to make. Does that make a weird uh does that make a weird sense? It's I get that what I was saying earlier is it's my my personal measure of success, you know? I don't think the game that sells the most is uh, you know what I'm saying. You know what? I don't want to get into the arty party because I was about to say I don't think the game that sells the most is also the most successful, but uh Oh, you're stuck, remember E and examined your equipped items for clues. I think the disc is probably one of the security into the bunker. So we just gotta find a hand and a sample. Okay, it makes perfect sense. Alright. It was lovely talking to Darren Corb. God, was it last year? Year before? We gotta get this is the thing, I keep saying we've got to get so-and-so back on the show, and then life gets very busy and I'm like, oh crud, I forgot to invite them on. Yes, game sales aren't what makes uh, the game the most valid. Yeah. Oh, Swan Dragon actually worked at SGG for the tech support. Oh, go you! All right, I guess we'll explore the barn first. And I guess we're rehashing a little bit of the conversation from earlier on, but the, the point that it was born of was... It's the, it's the great balance, right? Video games are an incredible incredibly expressive artistic medium. Oh, and Vulcanor. Watto. I'm just getting arty farty. Settle in. Video games are incredible. They are able to evoke experiences unlike any other medium because they don't ask us to just observe. They ask us to be. We are in these spaces. You know, sometimes we are characters. Sometimes we are self. But at the same time, video games need to make money. Like, it costs. You pay people's time. And if you want to make games after that, the game has to be able to sell in some regard. And so it's balancing the artistic intent versus the business, which is why we talk about the business of games as much as. Um, I feel that the optimal situation, what I would love, what I personally consider to be the biggest mark of success is being able to balance those two. It isn't the one that sells the most, or the one that is the most arty-farty, which is winning at games industry the most. It is the one that has those two in perfect balance. That's what I'm saying. Because, like, Katros was pointing out, like, COD makes all the monies. And it, they do. But what do they do with it? They use it to make even more of all the more of monies. Activision could fund an R&D team making experimental video games that don't have to even turn a dollar. And the thing is, they could do that without without breaking the bank even slightly. But that's not what they're about. They are an operation to make money. Now, again, we said this earlier, I do not believe the people that work on the Call of Duty franchise are money-grubbing bastards. I don't think that they are, you know, soulless cash-money millionaires. They are passionate game developers, and they are working in a studio that is making a pure product, but I believe those people put their heart into the things that they make. I think they care. It's just at that business tier. So at that point, this is why I say that it's not what I would consider to be a great um, uh, a great operation, because the business is so vastly outweighing the creative, and the creative is there. It's just, yeah. Yes, the people who make the games care, the people who control the budgets, on the other hand, very different matter. Uh, but there are flip sides, like, 
there are times when the business isn't regarded and uh j crypts says uh forgive my ignorance it's activision the distributor or the developer um activision i think publisher is a better there are multiple studios that work on the call of duty franchise but activision pays for it so activision have studios that they rotate in and out so they can keep um call of duty on a yearly cycle um the the thing that i also wanted to say is that this goes both ways studios where the business is ignored and the creative is everything where it's all about the art it doesn't work most of the time those kind of teams don't make it to launch because you know the game that you never release is perfect and when it comes to the the artistic of video games like unless you are making a personal project that you are not having to pay additional people for that's if you are funding your own video game or if you're just making it in your spare time you don't really need to worry about the business so much but that's its own challenge that's another matter um i have seen game teams become so enamored with the art and of what they're doing that they cease to regard the user the player with any coherence they don't think about the game selling they don't think about any of its involvement you know it is their pure expression of their idea and once again it's all about you know walking that middle path we mentioned it earlier but and i don't mean this to be nasty i don't, I don't mean this to throw stones but uh nidhogg 2 nidhogg 2 is a terrible game and I don't know if I would go so far as to say it is bad, but it has no regard for its user. It has no regard for who played it. It's, oh, uh, the corn of the world added to folio. A book outlining the difference and similarities of corn species across the globe. Several chapters also discuss the color yellow. A few species are circled in red pen, while no, no, no appears in many places across the entire book in blue pen. Uh, Catra says, like, Daikatana and Broken Age. Um, Daikatana, certainly. Ah, uh, okay, Daikatana's an unfair one, but I think that's close. Um, with Broken Age, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily an example. <laughs> A Perios Motra Dish Soap English Muffin Unlimited. How very dare. Sorry, Aperios reminding us all of the April Fool's Day of Corn Hub. Um, but, Katros, I see what you're saying. And Daikatana was definitely one of those titles that didn't... Where the creative vision was held above all else. But that also had some other elements i guess my analogy is a hyper oversimplification of a very complex process but i guess that's why i continue to celebrate um super giant games as an operation because in an incredibly complex environment with no clear rule set on how much on how best to create a game studio they've managed to strike this balance between making money and making the games that they want and You can't say fairer than that. I mean, the other thing to take into consideration... Oh, okay. Oh, that's haunting. Get pumped! Okay. Got a bloom. Uh, there's a pile of something or other you can sweep with this. But you already knew that. What you didn't know is that this broom is haunted. This will not affect your adventure in any way, as the ghost is currently away on business. Ah! Okay, so there's good, bad, and question mark? Okay. One half of a diagram added to the folio. 
Uh, a diary. Just be careful when the action gets hot. All corn soldiers are dangerous, but the kernels really pop off. Sadlin, I'm going to need to report to the Shadow Realm for that one. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. <laughs> Freaking god darn it. Sadlin, thank you for the 200 bits. You feckin' criminal. Brooms haunted! Anyway, diagram torn in half contains a very complicated looking equation scribbled in orange pen, a drawing of a person, and a DNA helix. Looks very important. You tried to eat it at first, but changed your mind when you couldn't find any salt. Alright, but besides this, there doesn't seem to be anything to interact with here, so we can keep going down a path. The other way is the silo, so I have no idea what's here. Ah! Tractor. And a blockage. Yeah, so sorry for getting into the, the, the long and short of it. Like, one of the challenges of video games, especially when at the, like, pitching and conception stage is, like, who's going to want to play this? How is it going to make cash? And the problem is, is that f finding that balance between, like, this is the perfect game that I want to make, and this is how this will make money so that we can continue, is a, a massive challenge. See if I know how to pick locks. Aha! Apparently I do. Okay, open the silo door. Get the corn to sweep up. Uh, a tattered blueprint. Uh, though it's hard to make out, the blueprint looks like it's the construction of a very large, very poorly planned facility with a farm situated at the top of it. The facility itself is actually set... Uh, uh, the facility itself actually set an agricultural record for having the largest number of corridors that lead to absolutely nowhere. Well, this needs a good clean. Ah! We cleaned the pile of corn... Ah! We cleared the pile of corn kernels with the broom and acquired the needle-nosed pliers. And stole a telescope, apparently. Uh, manufactured about a century ago, the telescope's effective range is in the tops of low-hanging trees. Possibly because its lens was uh, because its lens was put on backwards. Looks like it was used frequently with varying results. Uh, so Ionim says, uh, re on continuality of profits. Uh, my question was the DLCs were cheaper. I think the Paradox has a good model. I would agree. Um, they have a ver uh, Paradox. Okay. We've talked about this before. Paradox are very good at business. Um, they aren't the stab you in the back kind, but they're very good at business. So they are not with, uh, with they're not one with whom to be uh, trifled. Um, one of the things that they realized ahead of a lot of people is the long tail of PC games. So with their portfolio consisting of games like Europa Univalis and um, Stop Pressing Q, you're not the boss of me! <laughs> Sorry. Hearts of Iron, um, Crusader Kings. These kinds of games, people bought them and played them for years. As opposed to traditional... Uh, more triple A style video games where people buy them, play the heck out of them for a few days and then never come back. So what they realized was that these games kept selling. So what they did is they focused on releasing additional content for them. They were less aggressive about it than uh, other companies. And a large proportion of their products also allow, the ones that allow multiplayer will allow 
everyone to enjoy the content if the host owns it. Alright, this is going to start getting weird. Actually, so friendos, as we've hit, uh, we're just about to hit the three hour mark, I'm going to pee. <laughs> I will be back with you in a second and then we can hang out with some creepy faced corn and get into the real feckin' guts of this. Uh, I'm loving the conversation, so please don't skedaddle just yet. Uh, and don't do anything interesting while I'm gone in case I miss it. Alright? So, I'm gonna get. Oh, I'm also gonna get some water as well, because I realize I've just had two cups of coffee today. That's not smart! <laughs> um, but yeah, then we'll keep going with all of this. I feckin' love this chat. Not indulge me on a lot of good conversations, and I'm very grateful about this. All right, back in a second. Uh, and Moose, I will jump on that.
Hello, hello, hello. Uh, thank you all for waiting. Oh, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, forgive me, I realised I hadn't eaten. So, look, I'm being good. A male Sani, looking after my, humans, my human form. Um... <laughs> Numbers like, what are we gonna do? Leave? Yeah, I kind of, I didn't really leave us a, a map out the cornfield, did I? <laughs> the chair did not move, Fred. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. So Amalu is probably not a great example of like doing smart game dev business stuff, but there are loads of parts in the world where, like, uh, if you've got a company and a track record they will give you massive tax breaks to move your operation there that's a, p partially how canada ended up with such a booming games industry all right i see you oh okay i i thought the uh, the plot points were about to kick off so i made myself a sony see how this goes shard name tag uh it took you several hours of staring but you managed to deduce that name tag in fact belonged to a dead person i uh, did belonged to the dead person it was near and that uh, his name is fernando it took you several more hours to notice that the dead person was a lab assistant and then five more minutes to realize that you were trying to read the whole thing upside down ah. very fashionable fedora A uh, very fashionable fedora worn by a very fashionable person. Due to this, you are not putting this on your head, as you have not earned the right. On the inner tag, the owner wrote their name, Fernando. Yeah, not not styling. I'm not styling enough for a, a good hat. Sorry, forgive me while I stuck my face a little. And I believe that's Fernando's hand. Gloved severed hand. Wonderful. Okay, I know I shouldn't be cheering the fact that we just found a smiling corpse with a hand that we could remove. But that should get us into the big door. Jeez. I nearly spit Sarni everywhere for Hando. I hope you're proud of yourself for that one. <laughs> Miyagi Discover is asking if the screen is, is swaying or if it's the grass. Uh, let me leave it station. I'll leave the, the camera stationary for a second. I think it's the corn. What I will say, and I'm sure you've all noticed this, this game is doing an incredible job. It feels unsettling, but whimsical. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like we are safe in this cornfield. But at the same time, I don't feel like we're being hunted or threatened. And I think that's because of the humour of that's being conveyed to us. Sorry, I just... Sadlin and Moose were going into some of the details of, like, getting grants for video game companies and stuff. And this is where, like, the the chess parts of the business can happen. Because, like, especially if you're um, uh, a business that works remote, setting your company up in a place that can get you grants and tax breaks and things like that can save you a ton of money and can help down the, uh, down the road. Sadly, I was talking with friendos... God, at one of the gigs recently and sadly it seems that the English um, uh, the grants you can get in the UK for games have gotten much much worse since Brexit kicked in which is understandable but it used to be that you could get a, a large amount of money off of your project by a bunch of like gloriously bizarre criteria <laughs> 
And now I'm just wearing my sandwich. I know certain parts of the Netherlands have incredibly good tax breaks for video game companies, and a large proportion of mobile studios took advantage of that. Oh, sorry, that was the silo. Alright, so just to quickly check, we've got... Uh, the pliers might be able to pull whatever that thing was out of the... Um, uh, the sausage maker because we got the disc and we've got the hand we just need one more thing to open the big double doors or oh, sorry the big um, barn door uh, the big uh, vault doors yeah got there in the end and the thing is people don't tend to talk a lot about grants and funding and things like that because it's not really the fun part of the industry But sometimes it can be the difference between like, you know, your project succeeding and your project failing. If you make a video game in San Francisco with no additional funding or support, just the very process of making that game, the very process of existing in that region is incredibly expensive. So you put yourself in a position where your make and break point is very, very, very high. Uh, or to look at it another way, Indie companies will often talk about runway. Runway is how much time they have on a project before they run out of money. So anything that can increase your runway, that can reduce your overheads, allows you to spend more time on a game and have more of a safety net if it doesn't go well. So yeah, living and working in a very, very expensive part of the world isn't conducive, but moving to another part of the world where you can get tax breaks or your project can get additional funding, like feckin' yo. Now, because um, uh, Sadlin, Moose, and uh, Iron Imp having a great conversation, which you should absolutely join in on. I'm going to mention Never Alone, which was based on... <sighs> I'm sorry, I forget which Pacific... Oh, okay, Sadlin was going into it, but because of its thematics, it was given additional funding. Uh, also, uh, Mulaka, which is uh, based on the northern tribe, uh, the northern tribal myths of Mexico, was given a ton of additional grants by the government because of how it represented, you know, Mexico and Mexican heritage. And that game's cracking. So they had a game that was already that already slapped, and was based on things that were important to like local culture. And so because of that, they got a crap load of money from the government. And Asari, no worry. Totally understand. Welcome back. Because the thing is, if you can get it, government money's amazing. They expect very little in return. Usually promotion or to put their stamp on it. And their, their goal is usually one of like promotion or cultural promotion or what have you. So, so long as you're doing the things that they want, they ask very, very little in return. As opposed to, say, venture capitalists, which is the worst kind of money you can get. Don't look at me. <laughs> I'm making a mess of myself here. I'm supposed to go out into public tonight.
<laughs> Sorry, Wraith. I'm doing a job for you. Oh yeah, and as Moose saying, even if that um, particular funding agent, uh, the particular like government funding, do take like a cut of sales to to keep the fund going or what have you, it's going to be a better cut than you're going to get it from a publisher, and definitely a better deal than you get from VCs. The reason why VCs are so bad is because they will promise you the moon and they will give you a lot of money, but their expected returns are more aggressive and. At least from what I've seen, VCs change their structure and their goals very quickly. So you can be making a game, you can be like a year and a half in, and that venture capital firm's focus rechanges, and suddenly you've either got to deliver a project or pivot drastically, or or you're just SOL. Moosh, that's a great way of phrasing it. Thank you. VCs will promise you the moon, and they will demand a planet. And they may demand a planet before you've even had a chance to launch your missile, if you know what I'm saying. Wolfcrad, Iron Imp, Eremon, like, all spot on. Thought I saw something. So yeah, my advice is always, like, avoid VC funding. Like, if you need to keep moonlighting to keep working on, like, a vertical slice or enough that you can then pitch next year to publishers, it's feckin' worth it. Because there's no rule that says you can't pitch to publishers multiple years in a row. So long as you aren't being, like, weird and creepy or generally unsettling, like, publishers will be fine with you pitching the same game to them at, like, GDC the following year. Um, so long as you're not doing a Bob's game, you know what I mean? Aha! Warped key fob. Pull the warped key fob out of the sausage grinder. Not an ideal place for it. Oh, and we take the key fob upstairs and mash it uh, flat with a hammer. Sorry, there's a wonderful video on a game called Bob's Game about an individual making an indie game that he desperately wanted to have on the Nintendo DS and his escalating weirdness with Nintendo and how he came very close to getting a publishing deal and then essentially kind of like skeeved his way out of it. Uh, so Wolfcrad said, I mentioned runway and burn rate. The weird thing with VCs is that with them, more money doesn't usually mean longer runway, but faster spending. Um, you're right from a VC perspective, but um, VCs see video games as little money trees. Like, they put the water on, the money, and they want fruit in return. It's just that they don't care. So what will happen is they might say, yeah, here's here's two million. We want a game in three years. Everything you've spec us done. And then they'll turn around and go, actually, we want that game in a year and a half. Or, actually, we're liquidating your operations because in the deal, you sold us a controlling stake. So, good night, Greasy. Like, all it takes is for a, a minor shift. Now, the venture capital world is more complex than I'm making seem. And I've only seen smidgens of it. But... I would, I would take a scary indie micro-publisher deal over VC funding any day. Oh, 
Oh, and sorry, uh, Iron Imp, I didn't finish my thought there, you're right. When I say weird and creepy, I do mean like, in how you present and how you uh, pitch your game and then interactions after. So the idea being, if you have a sit-down meeting with a publisher, you pitch them the game, they chat about it, and they choose not to take it, don't keep trying to pressure them into changing their mind. Because they'll be like, oh, okay, this person's unnerving. Don't try and pull PR stunts during the pitching process. Because you could say on the one hand... Oh, an EXO. What, ho, friend? Hello, hello. Um, you could say on the one hand that being memorable is important. But again, like, you're in a business case and... Well, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of razzle-dazzle. Like, you don't want to pull any, like, marketing stunt-style maneuvers in the pitching process. Because you're showing the business people, I can make a game. This is the game that I will make if I get your money, and here's how much money everybody gets if I succeed. All right, let's go open a weird looking bunker. Astutus, so EA wants to invest in your fledgling game. <laughs> See, this is one of those ones where it's complicated because EA's got EA Play, which is their mobile and indie wing, which they've invested in some games that have come out really well. And they've had a few like internal creation programs that have gone real well. It's it's the way EA handles their, like, studio acquisition stuff and, like, large-scale projects. That's where it tends to go, like, squiffy sideways, you know what I mean? Okay, squiffy sideways needs to be my, um, my, uh, douchey developer name. Also, signs back to where we're going so we don't get lost in the corn. Lovely. Oh, yes. No, sorry. Exo is correct. The, um, uh, EA Play is the Game Pass subscription. EA Originals is the rebrand of... Oh, God. Again, corporate branding. It's a pain in the ass. Okay. Microsoft. Microsoft's a way better example because their naming conventions are much clearer. So you have ID at Xbox, which is the small term indie, which is usually like anything from like 25k up to probably like half a mil once it starts getting beyond half a mil then it gets into microsoft third party um which is where microsoft publishes your game like a traditional publisher and then first party acquisitions is when they buy your studio mostly There are caveats to that. That a a first party game being a title, well not necessarily developed by a Microsoft owned studio, will only be available on those platforms. Yeah, okay. You're right, Sailor, until you start talking about naming conventions for consoles, then it gets really weird. But for all intents and purposes, like, they're doing the the start of the consoles as a medium of... Like there's, Microsoft are starting to move away from console generations, which I think is telling. But that's another matter. All right. CD, severed hand, all right, key fob, well now, that I did not expect. We have a severed hand. 
we can take the glove off, like in that movie, glove off. <laughs> a severed hand, perfectly preserved in the glove that encases it. Could come in handy if you give yourself a hand and find a way to loosen it and get that glove off. The first pun was intended, but not the second. Yeah, uh, number is your right. Oil on it. We need to do it in the sink in the house. So trundling back. Okay, and XO. Okay, you are correct. Like you can get uh, exclusivity contracts as a third-party developer. I'm trying to think about it now without naming too many names. Anyway, I'm personally not uh, opposed to publishing deals. Like, in an ideal world, publishing deals are wonderfully... Uh, are wonderfully harmonious. Like, you need money, they have money. They need more money, you can make them more money. They handle all the stuff that you really, really don't want to faff around with. Uh, for example, you know, legalities, copyright, um, localization, compact testing, um, feckin... God, I always forget the proper term for it, despite it being a, a haunting memory of dark times. Compliance testing, that's it. So making sure that your title can be released on... Pour the rancid corn oil into the sink. It smells worse than imagined. Loosen the glove from the severed hand. Slightly disgusting. Mmm. Preserved severed hand. Let's see how the, the review on that one. Once you manage to tear it away... Once you manage to tear away from giving yourself an unending stream of high fives with this hand, you may want to find an actual use for it. It's not to start another round of high fives. <laughs> Compliance testing. <laughs> okay. Look, I'm just trying to high five our way through this, alright? Oh, actually, and I know, that's a very, very good point. Loop Hero definitely needed publisher support. And okay, yes, they might have been able to pay a translation company to do the English language translation. But the promotion that Loop Hero got, as well as the additional services Devolver provided, I think was worth it. And I'm not saying this because I'm countering um, Thor's opinion of release your game as you, because if you are able to do that, you should do that. If you can achieve what you want as a video game creative without needing to involve anybody else, then that's grand. Every title that you release of your own volition will... What did Zalavir call it? Zalavir called it pizza money, but I like to think of it as like as back catalog sales. You know, if you release Long Ship's English Muffin Puncher and it sells like 10 copies, but you then release um, Longship Battle Racing Bakery Edition, and that sells a crap ton of coffees. You're then going to start selling copies of Muffin Puncher because of the amount of people that bought your first game then transfer over to the original because of the coverage you're getting from that. Um, those long tails are how a lot of PC gaming focused companies survive. Sadlin sounds like sounds like the theme of the next long jam. We don't quite have enough people to do a um, uh, a game jam, but I do want to put some more squads together for the next like uh, either global or um, like game makers toolkit one or what have you. Doors open. This is fine. Hey! Hey! You must answer a riddle before Stop you're allowed to enter. <clears throat> a doctor and his son are in a car accident. No, not that one. 
Say the one about the guy who hung himself with an ice block. You just gave that one away. Answer this one. What animal walks on ball legs in the morning? That one's boring. I'm Riddle President today. I get to pick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Why is he oh, president right, every man. time? No, I've actually I did been a vote unclear on the election. Oh, we should just get really help with that. <clears throat> An empty bus pulls up to a stop and ten people get on. At the next stop, five people get off, and twice as many people get on as at the first stop. At the third stop, twenty-five get off. So, which one of us is named Jim? Am I Jim? I thought he was Jim. No, that's Bill. Where's Bill? You're Bill. Oh, that's right. You may as well enter as we sort this all out. Let's hope you're better than the last one. <laughs> See which just got in as like... Why are there corn people? Oh, and watch out for our brother down there. He's a bit odd. <laughs> ah! What do you mean, why is the corn British? <laughs> well, that was unexpected. Thanks, internal monologue. And steel, what ho? Now, the, see, I'm very happy that you're getting close to your first, um, payout on steam however the thing about the the long tail method is that you need to release multiple titles as each one does a little bit better than the last then you see a an increase in sales in previous titles as people check them out so until you have a game that uh, breaks atmo a game that becomes so successful under its own weight that it keeps going it's essentially releasing games as you go up to build a pile of back catalogue titles. Uh, sadly, what's-his-face from bloody Five Nights at Freddy's turned out to be a shite. Because he was a great example of, like, a, a working developer. So I'm, I keep trying to think of... I guess Zalavir is a real good example. Uh, oh, hey, Ted. Don't worry about it. I'll reset the elevator after a few more months of data. We overbought food pellets... We've got to get rid of him somehow. Bob. Bob, I told you to fix his elevator weeks ago. It takes hours for everyone to get in here because of your stupid experiment. Moron. Cordially, Ted. You pressed a button. Maybe Q does something. A stale food pellet. You ate the stale pellet. You pressed a button. Oh, God. Well, we're going to be here for a few hours. Good luck! Exo says they played this game for 20 hours, and now we know why. Right, and still, congratulations on getting a job, yo. Volcanor's like, oh, hey, look, it's the newest mobile game. It was the newest mobile game. Each time I ate something from the Skinner box, it would make a bunch of flashy lights at me. Aha! All right, the elevator begins to move. Stop that incessant clicking! Oh, this is haunting. Bob McTavish, Honorary Library. Uh, sorry, Honorary Lobby. The Bob McTavish Memorial Lobby. My God, Bob, what is this? Did you actually give uh, have the gall to commission a bronze statue of yourself? It'll cost us a fortune, you narcissistic dolt. Cordially, Ted. Hey, you're Ted, don't worry, I've got a good deal on it. Commissions these statues, uh, commission these statues in bulk. I think they really spruce up the facility, especially for the tour. Could be a big money maker for us, Bob. Bob, you are so very stupid. What about the term? What about the term classified? Don't you understand? We can't host tours, moron. Cordially, Ted. And don't think I didn't notice you put one near the farmhouse. Repeat, classified. Put it away, idiot. Cordially, Ted. 
All right, so here we have Bob McTavish, PhD, MA, BSc, DOP, Esquire, and founder of the Painted Portrait. And then, Ted. Uh, was that? Ted, I want to say that's like... MTH? Uh, co-founder. Oh, Ted Smith. Thank you. This seems fine. That seems bad. That's bad. Get, like, murderated by a sentient Snuffleupagus. Horror Beast went that way, so let's go the other way. Oh, here we go. Hey, you Ted! The fish shipment should be arriving today. Could be a pal. Could you be a pal and put them in the tanks for me? Thanks, Bob. Bob, you dummy! There are thousands of water tanks here. Do you realise how much feeding these fish is going to cost? Cordially, Ted! Alright, I'm, I'm digging this... Uh, I'm digging the battle between these two already. West Hook Checkpoint. More orange boxes. That's a lot of coat hangers. Oh, and a cheap jumpsuit. Ted! Ted! Exciting news! I got us a huge deal on jumpsuits. For the facility, I got thousands in bulk at a fraction of the price. I've already used some of the savings for my other great stuff. Bob! You idiot! You got a good deal on them because they're completely useless. No one can wear them cordially dead. Oh, security station. Let's see what it says. Reserve power mode active. Oh, a warfare readiness report. Let's give that a quick read. It appears to be a report on the warfare readiness of the subject of Project Maze. The report states multiple times that sentient corn... <laughs> had no discernible method of raising or operating a military firearm and have a habit of taking naps right in the middle of a test. The term abject failure appears to be over the document, a running theme on many reports involving the corn. <laughs> and we have a coat rack, in case anybody uh, needs that. But yeah, sorry, uh, we got onto silliness and plot. The business of finding funding for video games and the business of selling video games is not a simple one. As I was talking about this with Aperios the other day on admittedly a different business subject, but it's one of those, if there was one method that worked, everyone would just be doing it. Now, in some regards, with video games, there is the amount of time between conception and delivery that, you know, it's anywhere from like two to five years, right? Oh, hang on. Bob, stop playing your stupid games on my computer. It's screwing around the experiment. Idiot! Cordially, Ted. Oh, turned on the power strip. Uh, it did nothing. What have we got here? Bob, you disgusting slob. Don't you know how to read? Stop eating in here. Glutton. Cordially, Ted. Okay. What have we got here? Uh, the Grippertron. What's this? Bob, you jerk. Put my ram back where it is. I know you took it and hid it. That stupid spot of yours. Bring it back here, cordially, Ted. Um... But yeah, so with video games... Reactor online. Sensors oh, online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. What ho? I just got done with a cumulatively four-hour walk in the midday sun, so I am ready to chill. And I promise I at least try to keep hydrated. Go you. Go you. Uh, we are playing this gloriously weird little humor game. Oh, and we got a tour book. And talking about how to get money for your video games. 
All right, it appears to be an official guidebook for a tour of the research facility. A large portrait of text inside has been redacted, but 20 pages are fully dedicated to the giant vats, mostly and mostly repeat and refrain that the vats are very large and contain things that should stay in very large vats. Oh, got a couple more. Welcome to Redacted, the future is where? Hiya, Ted. The latest brochure came back from the press. Take a look. I think it really boosts the tour. And you'll be happy to know that most of the sensitive bits have been redacted. Safety first, Bob. Bob, first. You are an idiot. The brochure is incredibly stupid. Second, for the last time, no tours. I can hear Ted getting an ulcer. Third, if you're going to make a stupid brochure, at least add my name to it. We're co-research heads, remember? As in, the same title, jerk, cordially, Ted. Hi, Ted, really sorry, but the final print has been done and sent off. I'll make doubly sure the next one has your name underneath mine on the front, Bob. Good God, Bob. You have, you have the reading comprehension of a five-year-old. This is a top secret facility. Where did you send these brochures, you moron? Welcome to Cornland. Alright. I'm taking my coat rack and I'm exploring. Alright. The communal grotto. Okay, now it does explain all of those... Uh... Oh, that's horrifying. Uh, this does explain a lot of those uh, narcissistic paintings we saw up in the farmhouse. Uh, a cheeseburger wrapper. Originated from a local fast food restaurant, the nutritional information on the wrapper proudly proclaims now 100% salmonella free. There are no exaggeration. There are no, sorry, there are no exaggeration, thousands of these wrappers littering this facility. But a very fetching mustard stain on this particular one sparked your interest to pick it up. Hey, Ted. Notice you took down the painting in the lobby. Thanks. I had a little blemish on it. No sweat, though. Here's another one. Be a pal and put it up, would you please, Bob? Bob, I'm not putting another one of your paintings. You self-indulgent louse. For... Would you say this corn research is pop secret? I'm glaring at you, Vanderbeest. That's my glaring face. <laughs> Banner Beast, thank you kindly for the 200. Why must you be like this? And why is my face on that stupid horse? Oh, it's just this. It's all the cups. This glorious. Um... Oh. Corn's looking at us. Let's go talk to the corn. If a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? Hmm, interesting conundrum. What kind of tree? Fur. Can it talk? Yes, but only after lunchtime. Is it wearing a lot of bells? Some, but not many. Is it in a glass house? Naturally. I have it. It does make a sound, but since it's a tree, it's too stupid to notice. Correct! Well done. <laughs> this game is glorious. Uh, and I'm going to bet that it was Bob that died of salmonella poisoning. You, uh, you're not going to talk to me? Uh, apparently, I do not deserve conversation. Oh, but we do have a shift schedule. Uh, a schedule outlining work shifts in the entire facility staff. Most notable are the shifts of the two founders. They are completely opposite to each other. <laughs> Alright, let's see if we can find the, the Snuffleupagus. This bathroom is ridiculous. Okay, so we have a sketch of 3000. 
Bob, I don't know how you managed to copy my bathroom key. But good God, how many cheeseburgers do you eat? Oh, and there we go. An invoice from Opulent Bathrooms. The invoice for this incredibly extravagant bathroom calls for marble steps leading to two extravagant toilets and a sink encrusted with gold. Cost is in the hundreds of thousands. Ted left it on Bob's toilet seat with a very pointed statement about the financial capacity. <laughs> Not paying for this! I do like, friends, how when we hang out, our conversation can flip between the here's how you could potentially gain funding for your project and where to look at it, pitfalls to avoid, and potentially how to create a sustainable business for, like via video games. Ooh, that's, uh, that goes into the void. Uh, and then we're like, here's some poop jokes and talking corn. <laughs> This is unsettling. Well, this is definitely Bob's room. All right, look. military backpack. I think that's going to go on whatever the MacGuffin is. In the drawer, there's an a small screwdriver. Very handy. So far, the two things we've like dealt with has been the computer and I believe one of the paintings in the lobby. Yeah, see which corn people, you know, standard stuff. God, it's like it's like you haven't spent the whole weekend hanging out with sentient corn. Am I right? <laughs> Sorry, just I ended up adding. Be careful not to say. Ah, oh, shucks. You know what? Wolfcrad makes a great point. You know what? The corn people aren't just talkers. They're great listeners. Because they're all ears. They're all ears. All ears. <laughs> Extremely obvious fake panel. Oh, the gymnasium. <laughs> A dumbbell added to the folio. Uh, try as you might, you are unable to lift this more than two times in quick succession. And yet somehow you continue to carry it with you wherever you go. Ah! Sorry, uh, Moose was saying that uh, as Moose was saying that um, from the perspective of being in the looking for work dance, I do wish it was easier to land prototype to stage funding. I can't help but think that if the early stages were just a bit easier, there'd be some incredible projects that we could see coming along. I, it's a very, very good friend of mine hates Activision with a passion, really despises them. And it's actually because of that reason that Call of Duty as an entity raises so much money every year. And that if even a fraction of that money was put back into attempting to um, create like research and development areas or prototype stage funding, that they would be able to fund so many great creative projects. Or even from a business standpoint, having an accessible like like prototype funding stage like that would basically allow them to stamp whole swaths of potential generations of games coming up. Like they have the cash to do it. They could essentially rule all the new innovation coming upwards and at the same time help out a bunch of people who are very hungry and very out of work, who have creative concepts but not the means to bring it forward. But they don't. Because for them it's all battleship development. You know, the money generated from Call of Duty goes back into the engines for this gigantic battleship to just keep it moving. When we use the term battleship game, de uh, game development, it's the idea that, yes, you can have a gigantic aircraft carrier with all the bells and whistles that is unstoppable. However, the amount of fuel, like, people hours, the amount of re just raw resources needed to 
to maintain that thing going forward is ridiculous. And any time you need to turn that ship, it's a huge undertaking, you know? Oh yes, a lot of it does go into Bobby Codex Bandica Town. Do you know how many indie devs we could fund for a year's worth of prototyping on his bonus alone? So yeah, I don't vermintly despise Activision with the same passion as my friend, but I do, I do agree with his sentiment. Those that have... And the thing is, it's not even like I'm asking for, like, altruistic, you know, charity funding here. Like, I'm not even being that nice. I'm essentially setting them up for more money and success. Anyway, sorry, Loki, how are you doing? You you joined us at the rant part of our tour of this talking corn facility. How are you? Okay, the only way this report could sound more triumphant is if trumpets were blaring every time it was read explains the very promising results after examining one of the new uh, sentient corn stalks, a breed of ruby queen corn that shows high levels of intelligence. It also glosses over the fact that this specimen is somehow female, which was apparently impossible under the uh, genetic protocol the facility used to create them. Lady corn, if you will. <laughs> Loki, I've been known to not rent. You know, times when I don't rent, I have to sleep somewhere. Mmm, sweaty headband. Okay. Oh, what's this? A nondescript rock. Run of the mill rock with no defining features whatsoever. To discern it from billions of other rocks currently. Uh, with, sorry, with no discerning features whatsoever to discern it from the other billions of rocks currently in existence. Its name is Mabel. <laughs> uh, sadly, Cheese Leaves, no one named this facility Corn Hub yet. Although Aperios did reference that uh, particular April Fool's joke earlier. Well, I've seen enough dead space to know how this is going to end. Oh, goody. We're going to have a ball. <gasps> and you eat we teddy bear. Oh, and the children's block. Oh, sorry. Uh, this nondescript children's block adorned with letters and numbers and you spend a long amount of time trying to figure out which one is which. Eventually you sort it out, but the number five still fools you every now and then. Hey, Wolfgrad, no worry. You know, glad I could be uh, background accompaniment to your adventures today. Have a lovely rest of your day. <laughs> Maybe she's sculpted that way. Maybe it's Mabel. All right. Oh, sorry. It was the... I almost forgot about the incredibly obvious panel. Use the screwdriver to open the extremely obvious fake panel. <laughs> hey, Ted. Just a heads up. Put your ram right here. This way it gets less dusty. Signed, Bob. All right. I think I know where we're going with this. So this... This is going to get weirder, if you can believe. Okay. So. We bear. Alright, so what is this McGuffin? The old computer has been upgraded. It's not your best work. That's how RAM works though, right?
What? What are you looking at? Something on Vladdy's face? Why you not talk? Do you understand? Understand what Vladdy is saying. <sighs> Butso boy, you're a big idiot. How you survive by being stupid? <sighs> Fine. Vladdy, help. <sighs> Oh, why guys so many? Huh? Huh? What is this on Vladdy's back? This makes no sense. All of this is very stupid. <sighs> so, where we go? Yeah, it's Teddy Ruspin. <laughs> you have acquired Vlad. Prepare to be united. Forever. We need you to settle a debate on taking naps. Oh my god, what is that? What is... what is Plant saying? Is that a... It is... It's a helicopter! What? Da? Give me a ride, Mr. Helicopter! No, give me a ride! We can all fit just climbing! <laughs> my lucid drug! What's the way? Boy, Grisomnyoi! Chitania Vesela! What a rude contraption! Well, if you're just gonna be like that. <laughs> oh, right. We completely forgot. We have a message for you. It's very important. You should hit the showers. What's a shower? I have no idea. Vladdy does not like it here. <laughs> just the bear dead eyeing it, being like. No, I do not like it here. Oh. Hmm. See, uh, Iron Imp, I do appreciate what you're saying about the um, the Marvel series like WandaVision, Loki, uh, and even to an extent like Falcon and the Winter Soldier, how it has been experimental. I do agree with what Moose is saying that because those are all based on existing comics they're less risky but i do know what you mean uh honestly like i've been binging doom patrol recently and that so gloriously weird you know what i've still got that muffin all right i need your help little buddy Do you want me to pick you up? Like, I'll give you a ride. Can you can you sort the boxes? Okay, no. All right. What did the the corn told us to hit the showers, right? It's okay. I can't really comment on the current state of film and television. <laughs> Poor little buddy. He's so slow. Come on. Come on, little buddy. Come on. You can make it. You can make it, little buddy. Come on. This is how I get that little uh, arm, like, pulling me nose off. Um, sorry. I don't know how a lot of film and television funding stuff works. I do know that one of the reasons why we get a lot of uh, big works based on existing IP is that they're much easier to pitch. And especially when it comes to comics, because of the manner in which comics are created, essentially storyboarded, they can be much easier to transfer into television. And considering that long form TV is currently the most popular way of doing it, like. Let me stay here while you do your stupid things, idiot. I hear you, Vlad. I hear you. I 
And yes, I am being more than a little patronising to poor Teddy Ruspin. Ra ra Rospu Ted. <laughs> oh, and Jay Cripps, uh, it's always lovely to see you, and I really hope things are going well with you, friend. Um, but yeah, so I, know, I wasn't picking on your comments by uh, any means. It was more that, like, with the funding around video games discussion, it's it's a different kettle of monkeys right there. And with a lot of games, you really can't know until the prototype phase. Do you know what I mean? It should be me. It should be me. Surrounded by idiots. Rattle. Underappreciated, ridiculed, scorned. Really, what is that? X is not a number. What? Why is that there? We should have kept one around to ask about that. X is ugh, ridiculous. Hmm, much better. Some of my best work. We did saying something. What was I doing? Ah, yes, dealing with unwanted guests. <sighs> he seems nice. Yeah, is that Ted as corn? Loki's like, wait, what? What is this game? It's called Maze. It is a treasure. I've been saving this for a good while for like a for a day like today because. Uh, there we go. Um, I am heading to the Seattle Indies meet later on this evening. And not till, like, it doesn't start till 7, so I'm not leaving early, but... No, uh, numbers, uh, have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Where did it go? Not here. Ha! Not here. So insulting. How dare it! This insolence will not be tolerated! This one is dangerous. Not like the others. I can see it already. This one has a brain. Hmm. Must be dealt with. He's probably talking about you. Uh, it says, uh, a meat stupid. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Sorry, uh, before we got uh, interrupted by uh, incredibly entertaining sentient corn. I will say that it's lovely seeing how television is evolving into these great forms. And we're getting to see all these old uh, elements. When it comes to, like, the video gaming... The amount of time it takes to get a game to the point where you can prototype it and where you can actually start to experience and understand it is expensive. Now, what a lot of studios will do is, as one game is coming to a clue... Uh... Hold that thought. <laughs> Who has disturbed me? We are not amused that you have kept us waiting. Has our servant informed you of your task? No, of course not. Imbecile. No matter. One must do things themselves if one would like it done right. Feels like we have been trapped here for an age. Our cowardly captors saw to that by stopping the righteous light from bathing us in its glory. Of course, we would not expect one such as yourself to understand. But perhaps you are different from the rest. Dare we let ourselves hope that 
We have finally found our champion. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Corn Lady. Yeah, you have chosen poorly. Not. But we would be remiss if we did not at least let you attempt to do something of value. So, we bequeath to you your tasks. Restore energy to this wretched place once again. And raise the rings. Only then will you be worthy of consideration. Looks like you have something to do. In pure coincidence, a new path has opened to you. Ahead in the West Hook checkpoint. I do like N uh, Dark Souls NPC but corn. Also, whilst conversing with a friend and having a stroll, uh, upon seeing what turned out to be a hidden little passage, uh, a hidden little trail, I should say, they actually said a great chest ahead. And it amuses me and irks me in equal measure that I understood exactly what they meant. Dark Souls has corrupted me for life and I will never be undone. Oh, and that's lovely to hear. Sorry, Salem was saying that um, the Sandman series is in pre-production and Gaiman has been on record saying that he's never had more control uh, as a producer or creator compared to other works. Okay. Okay, I guess that's not the way just yet. is this yet okay hopefully uh, it hasn't done the thing it did before where I kind of half stood up got me noggin trapped perhaps we can uh, bust in Androff Watto how are you doing we are playing this glorious comedy game We've still got an English bloody muffin. Sorry, I, I apologies for losing my train of thought there. Um, I guess what I was saying is that with some of the really interesting experimental TV we've been getting of late, which I'm so glad is happening. Yeah, it might have been a bug. Um, the through line of how one creates those is much more simple. But I'm often reminded of Subnautica, and how Subnautica didn't really come together until like the grey boxing phase where I forget which particular mechanic it was that they added. And the thing that I wanted to mention was that with teams like um Ah oh, there we idiot. Go. So you are done being stupid up there. Good. Where we go? What will happen in a lot of studios, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm treading and retreading the same conversational points, I do apologise, is that as a, as one video game is coming to a close, so that the main focus is essentially around, like, QA, launch support, compact, um, there will be parts of a standard gaming team that won't have a lot to do, and traditionally that's the point where you put those individuals on other projects. Nope, that's... Oh! Bill! Such a terror. How are you doing? Fine. Have you seen our little companion? Yeah. <laughs> Teddy Ruspin. Ra ra Raspu Ted. <laughs> he's so grumpy, but he squeaks when he walks. <laughs> I love this guy. Ah! <laughs> Such a bell end. Probably you got me with a sock. Oh. I got you with your own sock. I, I think when it's... When it's... A, oh, God! Note to self. Get vengeance. Wait, I didn't know socks worked. <laughs> <laughs> Do what I know they're coming. How much are? Oh. Damn it! 
<laughs> that's that's gone now forever. Harbinger! Ah! Suck fight! Ah, oh, piss! <laughs> I'm gonna have to go fish those out now. Well, every sock I throw at you goes into the back of the cupboard, never to be seen again. It's because you're a terrible throw. I'm a great throw. You're just not in the way. No socks back here. No, no. Uh, above, um, uh, uh, above unit zero. Oh, cool! Damn it. Yay! Ha ha! My penny! You have been slain! Oh, <laughs> Headshot! Multi kill! No! This is probably because you are stupid. <laughs> the best calling me stupid now! He's not wrong. I'm sorry, where were we? <laughs> Clang's like, well, well, that's not how throwing works. <laughs> Rivers a game of what you need. Oh! Stooge once dodged a sock into the side of a filing cabinet. Oh! I'm gonna see if I can um, do anything with the uh, the pitcher in the lobby. There are too many containers in here. Vlad, he does not like it. Actually, Vlad, I'm with you there. Now I think about it, these containers are unsettling. There we go. Okay. Use the portrait as inspiration for the world's worst facial sketch. There we go. Sorry, Vlad. Gotta squeak all the way back. <laughs> Kestrel! Watto! Look at our tiny companion! He's got little squeaky feeties! Alright, Kestrel, I am... I, I think there is still more gloriousness to come. But I am sorry for the uh, the bits that you have missed so far because oh my word! Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, West Hook checkpoint. Yeah, dust in your eyes. It's Vlad, the I don't care bear. <laughs> oh, damn it. I'm sure someone online has made an I don't care bear. Alright, so here we go. Broken security checkpoint. So I guess we need uh, Vlad to check what? this out. Why is that Vladdy's job? What is Vladdy supposed to do? <laughs> so fucking cute. <laughs> This stupid thing will never work. It is... Huh? Okay. All right. Facial recognition security checkpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the coat rack, the cheap jumpsuit, and the terrible etch-a-sketch of Bob's face. Oh, and a sweatband, of course. Then let's see if the uh, machine will acknowledge. You must be joking. That never worked. Well, that was still stupid. <laughs> this game is a treasure. See, I hope you know, like, I think a lot about, like, the games we play in a week and, like, the structure and timing of it. And this is one of those ones that has been kind of, like, in my back pocket for a while. Because if you weren't playing this in the manner that we play it, this isn't a very, very long game. Oh, hey, look, you opened a door. Uh, this isn't a particularly long game, so it wasn't the kind of game that I would like. Oh God, this isn't the kind of game that I want to. Oh God, this place is massive. All right, let me just do some exploring. It's all right. We'll jump. We'll run back on down in a second. Sorry. Now I will note that we've been playing this for for like 
a couple of hours on a on a day that's lasted about four. All right, so we need a. Oh, I'm sorry, Vlad. I made you run all the way up there. We're going to run back down again. Sorry, buddy. Don't get a little feeties wet. Uh, I didn't feel like this was a game that we could have done the entirety of in a day because we probably would have cleared it and then had uh, had time after. Oh, an iron him. That's a. I take that as a very big compliment. I try and recommend people games that uh, they wouldn't have had the opportunity to try or know about. So thank you. It's too dark in here. I can't see a thing. Perhaps if we turned around. Oh, don't be ridiculous. This is a perfectly nice place to stand. Well, I can't argue with that logic. Neither can I. Oh yeah, uh, Kestrel. Since you just got here, uh, these are sentient uh, talking stalks of corn. As you do. Okay, door to hook room four. All right. Sorry, Vlad. We're going back down again. <laughs> the corn is alive! Yeah, what did you think children of the corn meant? It meant corn children. What do you mean a horrifying, classic, scary movie? Ah, uh, the iconic Half-Life loading corner. Oh, also, hope you like post-its. Okay, so first one. Bob, you buffoon. Why is there a lobby here, and what happened to the decontamination room? Hiya, Ted. Pretty sure I told you. Did a little rework here. I think this will be a real high traffic spot for the tour. Gonna be a real moneymaker. Words fail me, idiot. Cordially, Ted. And stop it with the statues. Cordially, Ted. Alright, what have we got? Bob, I noticed this flyer and assumed it was your work. So I will remind you, pools are not safe to hold chemical waste. Why did you order one? Stupid. Cordially, Ted. All right, let's have a look at the, uh, the flyer. Pools, pools and pest controls. Uh, it is a flyer for pools, pools and pest controls, advertising big savings for orders within a 20 mile radius of the shop, along with free extermination of one pest. The cheapest pool in the flyer has been circled several times in red pen. <laughs> On the plus side though, no decontamination. Right, what have we got here? Uh, a lobby design brochure. Um, lobbies, lobbies, lobbies! Oh. I wish I hadn't said that out loud. Uh, a brochure for a company whose main goal is to fulfill uh, all of your low to mid-level lobby needs. On the back, one design in particular is circled with red pen. The cheapest one. With the company tagline reads, Waiting never felt so good. Alright, let's see what we've got here. A book of nuclear reactor maintenance guidelines. Oh, good. This is quite possibly the worst written book of guidelines in the history of time. Not one of the guidelines makes sense, and all the instructional drawings consist of stick pers a stick person running away from a large fire. Yeah, what could go wrong? Okay, so what have we got? Bob, I have made this map so our staff can restart the bargain basement reactor you ordered without blowing us all to kingdom come. Do me a favour, don't come anywhere near it. Moron. Cordially, Ted. Ted, Ted, I solved your maze. It took me a little while, but I got there in the end. Bob. Bob, how are you this stupid? Did you get your doctorate out of a cereal box? God, it's glorious. Okay, so we can't go that way yet. A good old fashioned nuclear reactor. Okay, sorry, Ted. I don't need to keep running you around. All right, so. So, core access here. 
Okay, so I guess later on we get to essentially uh, run the proverbial gauntlet to turn the reactor on. And to those of you who just joined us, um, a, a few people pointed it out earlier, and I have to say, like, the, the Douglas Adams in this shines through gloriously. Alright, so... So we came in through there. No, we came in through the big, ruddy, great big door. So this is the other way to go. I'm sorry. I'm starting to feel bad about little Vlad and his tiny feeties. And making him walk up all of these stairs. Ah, me and my human legs. I'm just going to walk three steps at a time. Uh, take your time, Vlad. You'll be fine. Squeak your way up this lot. Uh, Stu says, how do these guys manage not to kill one another? Honestly, they kind of reminded me of the, the Melter Brothers from the Blackwell Chronicles. Yes! I think it's because... I don't know. It's... By the looks of things, they don't actually work together. From what we saw on the, uh, the schedule earlier, they actively avoid, like, working shifts side by side. Controls are a video game. Oh, okay. <laughs> you decide to pick this up because you like the direction of the grain of wood and it gives you splinters every while, uh, and it gives you splinters while holding it from every conceivable angle. Oh, that's bad. Stupid American garbage. <laughs> All right, so locked toolbox. All we have is the English muffin. Submarine assembly manual. Uh, Stooge, let me see if Q does anything. Nope, still nothing. Uh, okay. The, an instruction manual for building your very own two-person submarine. Since Bob and Ted opted for the budget model, the manual is 800 pages long and mapped out in a fashion that is similar to a choose-your-own-adventure novel. God, I love that. Okay, so we know we've got to solve problems in here if we want to proceed. Alright. Hey, Ted. Uh, FYI, I bought the acetylene gas tank from the farm for the annual staff barbecue. Completely corn free, of course. Haha, <laughs> Bob. Bob, how many times I told you we can't have barbecues on the farm? Put it back. We're days behind schedule. And stop joyriding with the tractor. Small key. Uh, it's a shame you don't have small hands, as handling this key would be much easier. It looks like the key for a toolbox lock, which could be useful if you could manage to find the fine motor skills needed to operate such a small instrument. Vlad, you're a treasure. An improvised design for a loading crane. Ah. Uh. Created by Pete's Games and Carnival, the design of the loading crane appears to be based off of a simple claw game, a fact which uh, excited Bob to no end. Ted, controversially, wasn't too thrilled about it, but was stuck with it anyway after Bob forged his signature on the approval form. Great. Water. Bloody's favourite. Oh, I'm not going to make you go in the water, buddy. Bob, for the last time, stop leaving your junk everywhere. I don't even know why you have a cello case. You don't even own a cello. Strange seal box. All right, hey, Ted. Need this box of knickknacks loaded. Be a pal and move it for me, would you? Bob, you sloth. I'm not your errand boy. Load it yourself. All right, let's get some keys. Let's do some nonsense. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I keep feeling morally bad about poor Vlad. All right, 
right, so a box cutter and a hammer. All right, this we can work with. So I assume we need to find something, place it there and crack it the heck open. All right, oh, actually, we just check the thing on the box cutter. Box cutter! The cheapest box cutter commercially available. This brand holds the distinction of being the only one that is rendered completely useless after one swipe. <laughs> Why you pick up so much garbage, idiot? Vladi does not understand. You know what, Vlad? I don't understand either. But here we are. Here we are. For some reason, you feel the urge to break something beautiful with this, instead of doing the standard task of hammering a nail. You don't know why you do these things. The Fab Fabergé egg and the hammer. Hop a char! Smashed the priceless Fabergé egg with a hammer for some reason. And now we have the priceless lockpick. Sorry, uh, Katastros, what was that? I couldn't hear you over the sound of me smashing priceless eggs. What was that? All right, so what's in, what's in a locked cello case? It's... Nuclear fuel rod! Okay, Vladdy won't say this, but he could probably crawl through that vent and unlock the door. Now, can I go down into the water? No, okay. I can't just swim to sanity. <laughs> I just saw Katros's, your suffering will be legends. Usually I'd make some pithy comment right now with a, followed by cackling laughter and a do your worst. But then I remembered, I'm lit we're literally doing a thing on Saturday. Why am I stupid dum dum? Uh, in there? Oh, butzel boy. He squeaks more when he crawls! Here, making Vladdy crawl through dumb thing. What is Vladdy supposed to do in here? Stupid! Ah, ah, stupid wires everywhere! Why is this stupid... Oh, ah, ah, why is this stupid thing upside down? Makes no sense! How stupid are these idiots? Maybe a Vladdy gets... Oh, ah, Vladdy has to... Oh, I can't do this dumb... Ah, ah, boy, I so many... <laughs> Thanks, Vlad! Hey, idiot! Did that work? Stop being stupid and say something! Fine, Vladdy done anyway. Two more Lushy drugs, stupid idiot. Could get nowhere without Vladdy. Vladdy has to do everything. So, now what? Vlad, you're a fucking treasure. Vladdy did not like any part of that experience. Also, a new path has opened up to you. Probably somewhere radioactive. Sorry, I was just reading Iron Imp's story about, um, uh, so apparently the, uh, the gas that was used there is a fuel propellant for cutting metal that apparently Bob tried to use for a barbecue. And once again, I'd like to remind you all, there's a great big difference between can't and shouldn't. You could barbecue your food types with a, a blowtorch specialized at destroying, um, Destroying and cutting varying metals probably isn't going to get the best results, but you could still do it. And Iden was saying apparently someone, uh, well, a Florida man situation where someone stole one of those cutting torches and attempted to break into an ATM. However, he only succeeded in melting the ATM, resulted in it being pretty much unusable. Okay, so containment control... I'll remember that. It'll be fine. Try not to be an idiot in there. It would be very bad. 
Bloody stay here, in case you do something stupid. Hurt and offended, Vladdy. Hurt and offended. All right. Let the radioactive games begin. The Bob P. McTavish. Commor commemorative reactor. Oh! This is bad. I pushed a button. Wasn't meant to push a button. I've just spun myself round in a circle. Shouldn't have done that. Wasn't my brightest moment. Hey, I'll, if I get a little bit of radiation, I'll be fine, right? Like, like, like a little bit. Yeah, no, I'll probably be fine. Maybe I'll get superpowers. Uh, place the fuel rod containment canister. Now run back and hit that button again before you blow up. Wait, what do you mean blow up? Darn it. See, I can remember my way backwards through the maze. Ha <laughs> ha, I get what they did there. I'm leaving this the absolute worst review on Yelp when we are done. So feckin' help me. Completed horrifically unsafe fuel rod insertion process procedure. And I had 38 seconds left on the clock. Check me out. <laughs> I could never have kids again. Actually, so Androff, we're not even... Uh, Vlad might be safe. I'm not even entirely sure who we are in this. Alright. Restarted the worst nuclear reactor in the world. Facility power status is okay. Go us. So that's one task. Yeah, Andorf, what if we're all corn? What if we've been corn this whole time? Ooh. Stole the coffee machine. Uh, you took this, not because you want to make coffee, but you heard that coffee machines grant you one wish. After much thought, you wished for coffee. It didn't come true. Coffee machines grant one wish. I'm starting that. Uh, that's that's going to be Will's urban myth. Okay, so we've got power now. Uh, we can't return just yet, so we'll have to check the, the up and down. We haven't found... Um, yeah, all we've still got is our English muffin from the beginning. I'm gonna bloody do an English bloody muffin. Uh, Alright, we need to... Sorry, Vlad! Running the other way now! Um... Wow, sorry, my conversational abilities have dropped off a cliff. Oh. Ark of the Conclave says we're getting 200 bananas worth of radiation a second. <gasps> So many bananas. I will say that there's a pithiness to this game that I'm in awe of. As I was saying earlier, um, they uh, they released all of the PAX Online supercut of all the silly nonsense I got involved in. Um, and one of the things that I'm still so envious of is people that can write funny. I talk a lot of comics, let's be honest. And occasionally, by sheer, like, monkeys at a thousand typewriters level of banter, occasionally I'll what hit upon something. Stupid thing? I have no clue. Occasionally I'll hit upon something vaguely entertaining. But that's only by pure, like, like, maths and force of, of 
force of will. Ha <laughs> ha! Anyway, we've got a rock. That's more important. This rock has no idea whether it is a rock, a facsimile of a rock, or an algamation of many rocks or a non-rock. By picking it up, you have undone all of its conclusions. Uh, all of it, you have undone all of its conclusions about the world up until this point. You've named it Wallace. Okay, so that's a control console slot. Is it open? No. Darn it! Where are we gonna get a control slot from? Shenanigans are tell thee! Sorry, so what was really interesting was working with um, Laura, who is someone who can write funny. And I'm always in awe of people that can do that. Like, on very, very rare occasions, I've been known to say something vaguely entertaining. <laughs> Kestrel saying they love Wallace's voice acting already and would absolutely like to know who did the voices. Yeah, no, uh, when you uh, check the uh, IMDB page for Wallace, let me know. Oh, I'm sorry, Vlad. Okay. Uh, I have definitely take us, taken us on exactly the wrong, exactly the wrong place. Glad you lovely little squeaker. I'm so sorry. But yeah, that's, sorry. It's my uh, point drops out of my head once more. I'm in constant envy of people who can sit down and kind of like work through the process of being funny. It's just, it's such an alien skill to me that I find myself in genuine awe of it, you know? Uh, it must have been in here and I missed it like an idiot. So it wasn't in the lobby. Could have been in the control room. Because there aren't many other places to go. Sorry for walking around so much, little buddy. Oh, I'm hoping it's not down in there. We don't, have, we don't have a jump button. We do have a muffin button, but we don't have a jump button. Oh, and Kestrel, uh, I do have a used coffee with me already. Good thinking, good drinking. Uh, Fiona made coffee this morning that has the potency of jet fuel, and I love it. Um, but I'm trying not to drink too much, lest I forget how to communicate to other humans. Uh, and Andorf, it is easier to be funny with friends because, yes, you can play and riff off that one. Especially when you kind of know, like, the meta of each other's humour. When you have yourself a good little social group, you can kind of develop almost like a, a, a standardized meta between your different styles of jokes between friends, which can work very, very well. Oh god, you know what it is? I've... I get the feeling I was meant to grab something when I was over there, and I didn't. <sighs> I'm sorry, friends. Uh, Moose says it also helps if you're able to edit around the riffing, like assumed response timing and all of that. Very true. I mean, okay, the reason why I think this is um, uh, an important thing to banter on is being funny in video games is incredibly hard. Like, for those of us that grew up with, like, Monkey's Island and stuff like that, like, sorry, Monkey Island and stuff like that, we were exposed to very funny games. Uh, Sam and Max hit the road. And that was just kind of the standard, you know what I mean? I I feel like what like Tim Schafer, uh, Mr. Gilbert, all of that squad did back in the day 
towards humour in video games was so well inspired. Okay, so I didn't miss anything. Okay, so how did I biff this? There's clearly something I missed. Uh, um, well, I need a control panel. This game hasn't been too, like, like overly technical with um, where we find things. Interesting. Sorry. There were a lot, a lot of humor games for a bunch of us growing up. And all of that stuff is fed in quality. But it gives this almost unreal... Well, at least as a kid, it gave me an unrealist expectation of how easy it is to be funny in games. Spoiler, it's not. It's bloody difficult. Now, I will say, at least from what we know now about how to produce horror video games, like, since the, since the new wave of horror games, we've definitely mastered the art of, of spooping an audience with a video game. Beyond just... Beyond just rounds of ooga booga booga. Alright, whatever it was, it wasn't in there. Oh, Ami, actually, that's a very good idea. You're probably spot on there. We're probably supposed to steal the wheel from the door that's already open. All right. Sorry, Vlad. I'm marching you around again. Oh, yeah, Androff. No, you're definitely right. I probably missed some of the radiation, so I'm glad we got to, to go back and just soak up the goodness. Now, uh, Katastros was saying that they can write pretty good, um, and it's one of the things they feel quite confident about, but it's a case of fluid language. Coming up with things to write about is a beast that few can actually understand how hard it is, professional writers included, but humour, horror, romance especially hard since they, are, they rely entirely on a reader's emotional reception and interpretation since no two people will think exactly the same things are funny, scary, and romantic. That's a very good point. Humour has the additional problem of timing. Ah, oh, darn it. I can't just pull the wheel off this one. Find the one up here. And pull the wheel off that one. Oh, and I do think these conversations are very important because learning how these different modes impact our viewership and impact us helps us understand them way better and helps us like okay so romance horror comedy all incredibly difficult all incredibly evocative thematics like And the manner in which you deliver them in video games is exceedingly tricky. Uh, I'd say that at least in romance, we have a better understanding. Again with the crawling. Sorry. Stanya Veselo. That's what I missed. Uh, what is Vladi doing here? Is this Vladi's purpose? Crawling <clears throat> and climbing through stupid <clears throat> junk to get. Uh, more stupid junk? And for what? This stupid garbage? This is useless. No use. No purpose. Just more garbage. Garbage for idiots. Always... Garbage. Yet them ya lublu. Of this garbage worth bloody suffering, but I already know the answer. No, because it's garbage. <sighs> what stupid thing is next? Okay, sorry. I want to jump back into to chat because people are making some really, really good points. Um. So Fred was adding, it's also why a lot of game humor, particularly party game humor, is kind of bottom feedy. Very true. Um, uh, Ionim says that humor can accumulate a uh, sorry horror can accumulate a slow burn structurally, but humor can't. 
I mean, I'm not a good enough writer to say that it can't be done, but if you ask me how to deliver slow burn horror, I can give you a much better framework than if, like, how do you deliver slow burn humor? Um... And the thing is, I can point to other mediums, but I can't point to a slow burn humor in a video game. Do you know what I mean? Um, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite series is uh, Gintama, or Gintama, or call it whatever the fuck you want. Um, and yes, I know it's an anime, but it does a great job of the slow burn horror that, that the slow burn humor that I haven't seen others. That's the one that jumps into mind. Like, they spend three episodes building up to one joke that is delivered so brilliantly. The way they manage to do it is the premise is very ridiculous, and then the cast is given time... Uh, then the story is given time to settle in the ridiculous before the, the reveal of why the ridiculous has happened. It's very good. But yeah, as Ina was saying, the player inherently janks the timing. And Androff, I think he's calling us garbage, yes. Which, I don't know if you've seen me, but that's not entirely unfair. So it's like, I still think Hume is one of the, the trickier of the, of the more direct thematics. Because, again... Horror and fear we have studied a lot, and games get a lot more tools in their arsenal that non-interactive mediums get. We put the person in the situation. So it's not a character's stress that we're experiencing, it's ours. That's Feck and Traf. Um, when it comes to romance, whereas as the video game market sits currently... What bloody do next, idiot? As the video game market since currently, you can target specific groups. Now, obviously, I'm always going to put things like Dream Daddy uh, up on a pedestal because they pitch being a silly romance game and end up saying something more than just their core. But, like, whatever your preclusivities, if you look on Itch or Steam, there is a dating game based around those. There's also ones that are based more around sexy feels rather than romantic feels but that's another matter comedy is the one that it's so hard to point and go that's funny you know the amount of time it takes for a video game to be creative you can't do kind of like reactive satirical humor that that apes on popular culture because the culture of video games is changing there was a group of people that did a, a 2D video game that was meant to be a parody of uh, Mass Effect, but Mass Effect as a franchise has changed drastically. Now, I know that's a very good point. A had a full boyfriend does go surprisingly deep. That's the powerful thing about that one is it brings it brings you in with a humor premise and then sticks it with some decent writing, at least absurdist but decent. Does that make a weird sense? And now Fred was saying mass market, mass market humor is often stuff like ugh, cards against humanity. Yeah, the the race to the bottom. Sorry, Vlad, buddy. All right, let me plug this in real quick. So, this is what stupid thing does. Vladdy still think it garbage. <laughs> the thing you did was important. Probably. Aha! Vladdy think you may have problem, idiot. You take too much garbage. <laughs> I do. Broke off the door thanks to the shoddery soldering job uh, done immediately after the facility Christmas party. You could probably find another door and fit it on. Just not this one. Oh, I should also say that, like, I don't have a direct answer to how to be funny in video games. This is landing because it's pure absurdist. 
the fact that the voice of sanity in this bizarre world we've been dropped in is essentially like a talking mech robot from Russia. Mech teddy bear in a land of like corn that yells at us and very, very strange puzzles. But you'll also notice that we, the protagonist, do not have a voice in this space. Like, the interactions are done by... Uh, sorry, the, the beats are done by the elements around us, and usually after we have completed X puzzles. But, like... Thinking of games that attempt to be, like, intentionally funny, like at Thimbleweed Park, and games that are exceedingly funny, like Later Alligator. Like, I couldn't... I mean, perhaps we could sit down and deconstruct how some of the genuinely funny games are able to to do what they do. But, like, if you were if you were to ask me, Will, what are the core tenets of a horror game, I can tell you. If you ask me what are the core tenets of a humor game, I'm like... <laughs> Oh no! Sorry, uh, MDH was just saying that they got um, uh, they are overheating a little due to sunburn. It's like, oh no! I'm sorry, friend. Sunburn is the worst. Punching it. That does not sound good. That doesn't sound good. That sounds bad. Chitanya Vesilo. Why is this place so stupid? Nothing works. Idiot American machines. Well done, idiot. Breaking it will help. Stupid. You should take that dumb PC if you can fix it. Breaking everything won't help you progress. Just in case that wasn't clear. Alright, a broken half again. New path has opened. You can head back to the communal grotto. Uh, and down to level 2. Okay. And yeah, he does look like Teddy Ruxpin. I forget who it was that said it first, but Teddy Ruspin... Or Ra Ra Rasbu Ted. <laughs> I love both. Also, one of the lovely things about this game, you've noticed that it doesn't leave us to explore blindly the entire world. It's using these orange boxes essentially to, to keep us from getting too far off the beaten path. Which is what we were talking about earlier about like puzzle games as narrative or puzzle games as challenge. Like Mist is puzzle game as challenge, right? There is a narrative through, but the the experience is about the challenge of solving the puzzles. This is using puzzle solving as a focusing crystal to, to get us in the certain places for certain times to then deliver humor at or with us. So essentially, if, okay, if we stop and think about it, there are two there are two major threads of humor throughout this. There's like the uh, there's the passive humor, both our internal monologue, tool tips, and the absurdist the absurdist nature of the environment we're in. And then there's kind of like the active humor. So like the the plants talking at us and how the story is progressing, how the lady corn is this formal like near Dickensian this garbage everywhere. In my defense, I don't put it here. Oh, here we go, to level two. Oh, that's bad. Okay, uh, Katastros, have a lovely rest of your evening. As always, thank you for the wonderful conversations. Uh, and I, I hope this was entertaining. Ah, the Crystallian Watto? <laughs> yes, I am playing an exceedingly corny game.
Oh, sorry, where was my train of thought? Oh yeah, so okay, so we have two threads of humor. Uh, we have like the active and the passive. It's time Vladdy told you where he is from. Vladdy is from small box, very dark, then stupid idiot brought him out the box, and it was sad. Now, we are here. <laughs> I thought we were about to get like a, a huge, uh, like, slam dunk of uh, lore there. Bob, you dummy. Why you commissioned that artist to make these maps is beyond me. They are unreadable. Everyone is getting lost. <laughs> they got an impressionist painter to do the facility maps. Bob, I don't care how good the deal is you've got. No more lobbies. You idiot. <laughs> uh, oh, eating room. Aha, this is where we saw um, the big mad corn. Okay. Uh, ass stupid. Nailed us. <laughs> That's humans, am I right? Alright, so what do you get? Uh, red marker. I just want to read the... Um, you mistakenly thought this was a blue marker, but you didn't want to put it back. Uh, put it down back lest you hurt its feelings. Instead, you will draw a face on something with it, because you know it likes to do that. And we got... Uh, Theme park and casino construction outline. A very slick looking proposal to rework the facility into a high end theme park and casino resort. Has a lot of pleasing uh, looking graphs pointing upwards, so you know for sure that it's a good idea. Some notable attractions include Vatland, uh, Genetics Kingdom, and Kitchen. <laughs> ah! Oh, it's just. Ems, he's so tiny and so grumpy! And he makes little squeaking noises when he moves. <laughs> oh my god, Bob, what is this? There is no there is no way in any conceivable universe that we could turn this facility into a resort. Stop it, you dummy. Guess was like, I wanna hug him. Same. But I feel like he'd be he'd be okay with it, but also super grumpy about it, you know? Oh, we stole a water cooler. You were mistakenly trying to pick up something else, but now you're in possession of an entire water cooler. You are too stubborn to put it back down, so you're going to have to find a use for it. Carrying it everywhere you go. You didn't even empty out the water. Uh, I will say the other thing that this game is doing very well is it is not reliant on any previous gaming knowledge, which is something that some humor games have tried to do, is use kind of like the... Uh, we took a wrong turn somewhere. An excellent conclusion. Yes, quite. So, what do we do? Well, naturally, if we take as many wrong turns as we possibly can, we will eventually make a right one. Of course. Brilliant. And if not, we'll take a nap. You read my mind. I don't know how they stumbled upon my business plan. Uh, I need them to give it back. <laughs> Oh, new rock! Oh, that's haunting. Glass ceiling toilets. God, no. Alright, item added to the folio. Now this, now this is a rock that knows its place in the world. Unquestioning, unwavering, happy and basking in its complete and utter rockiness. You've named it Shelby. We have so many rocks now. Oh, and a sturdy box. This is absolutely, positively, the sturdiest box you will ever find. Except for the one you see immediately after you pick up this one. You now have what is known as Boxer's Remorse. <laughs> but you can see what I mean on, like, the passive humour, right? Like, we can encounter that element anywhere, and it's kind of a standalone, just... Uh... <laughs> Alright, so here we go. So, Bob, what do you think of this? Uh, see what you have driven me to? Jerk. Cordially, Ted. Hiya, Ted. This is great. Really excited to see you getting into the spirit of things. Added one of mine so we could be side by side. I really think it balances the space, the, the space so well. There's Ted. And there's Bob. They even started lifting up the ceiling to fit him in. I think it 
safe to say we know what we're going to be doing here, which is box, water cooler. All right, we need to find some more stuff. Oh, another memo. Also, one of the interesting things about this is they don't write the text of a lot of the documents. What they write is our, is not even our impression, but the uh, the writer's humour as to each of these, which is something to take into consideration. Like, we're not actually reading all the details in this note. They're not trying to hide the humour between the characters in this. This is just our take from it. But through a very, very Douglas Adams lens, you know what I mean? Again, friends, if it seems like I'm deconstructing this stuff in a baby manner for babies, it's because I don't I don't know how to deliver humour in this medium. I recognise it, I love it, I experience it. But if you could ask me how you would start to plan all of this, I've got no feckin' clue. Uh, giving up on the corn's ability to be weaponized on any level, the scientists attempted to see if they could be of any use in the general workplace. They weren't, opting to take naps instead. However, the corn did display a fondness for stacking orange boxes, which they did ev uh, they did so every chance they could. The goal of which seeming to be directing the researchers to do what they wanted. Yeah, but Kestrel, but how do funny? Oh, oh well, anyway, that doesn't matter because we're in the cafeteria. Ugh. Four quid for a hamburger? Back off. Oh, wait, no, four dollars. That's not too bad. All right, what does everybody want? Oh, sorry. You take so many useless things, idiot. Uh, plastic plant. You'd think this particular plastic plant was perfect, if not for the garish pot it was attached to. You have an unnatural hatred of clay pots of every size, shape, and color. All right, Kestrel wants the ice cream. Let me see how much that is. Uh... I'm not reading out the full menu. Uh... Kestrel, you might be out of luck. Uh, I think they're out of ice cream. When you wish upon a coffee pot. <laughs> Bun with three ends. Uh, I can do you soda, combo upsize salad, uh, unnameable snack, coffee, cheese bacon, and muffin. We've got burgers, steak, fries, Italian pasta. And that is it. This is a limited choice. All right, see if we can... Locked kitchen door. All right, can't open it yet. That seems pretty heinous in there, but... Uh, Kestrel, I thought you already got my spleen. I didn't realise those regrowed. And if they do, did, let me have my new ones. Yeah, jokes on you. Don't need Miss Blaine. Uh, Fearless says, depends on the kind of humour. For example, when making a shooty gun bang, you have a much different approach to run and gun. Boomer shooter than duck and cover. Same goes for humour. Well, And this is where I think deconstructing it. So, like, you're right. Monkey Island versus Goat Simulator. Monkey Island, almost the entirety of its humour is delivered through dialogue. So it is... It, the the humor is done via the banter, via the interactions. So there's less passive humor, more of the active direct. Goat Simulator essentially. A Goat Simulator has this biz, this gloriously bizarre wackiness to it, but none of that wackiness comes from the the active humor. I guess it's all like sandbox silliness. Um, I guess reactionary humour might be a way to phrase that, but I can't think of a, a good one off the top of my head. Like a term for, you know, goat kick person. Person fly through air screaming and land into toilet. Toilet explode upwards. Uh, the, the physics chaos of it all. I'm trying to think of a good term to, to deconstruct that one. Sorry, Phyllis, I didn't mean to, to say like, no, no, no. I was, uh, I guess I'm just talking it through. Because you're right, there are different kinds of... It's not just action shooty gun bang. 
you know, the difference between, you know, your Quake 3s and your feckin' Tarkovs or what have you. Aha! So I know what we place there. A plastic plant. And there, we will need to place a bowling ball. This place is mildly heinous. Pruning shears. Let's keep pruning one. Uh, Bob bought these to help maintain the large number of plants that decorate the facility. The small fact that they were plastic and didn't need any maintenance didn't deter, deter him in the least. Yeah, and now, funny! Androff says environmental absurdity. Essentially, yes. Because you can proc environmental absurdity even in serious games. But something like Goat Simulator is laid forth in such a manner as to encourage the absurdity. And Kestrel loves absurdist humor. I mean, same. It's my favorite. That's why this game slaps. It's a it's a story about talking corn. Like, what's what's not to like? Oh, here we go. A box of monkey treats. Bob mistakenly thought that uh, capuchin was another word for delicacy, and ordered a thousand boxes of uh, to snack on. When he was told the snacks were in fact for monkeys, he ate them anyway. Sorry, uh, I just I just saw the box art. New size! Who cares? They're monkeys. Made with real stuff. Maybe! You've got a hungry monkey. We've got just the thing. Uh, MDH says they will always prefer banter over other forms of humour. Oh, hells yeah. Um... What's the bathroom's got security lock on it? Okay, a trimmed plastic pot. That's much nicer now. By freeing this plastic plant from its potted prison, you've managed to trigger a dramatic series of events that led to you obtaining the trimmed plastic plant. These events included reaching out to grab the trimmed plastic plant, picking up the trimmed plastic plant with your right hand, and wondering why you did all of this in the first place. Okay. What have we missed? Also, you don't know if you've all noticed, there's a there's a haunting green haze about a lot of this place. Oh, here we go. Nav a navigational chart. <laughs> Operation Subquanium Avendia. God darn it, this hurts my eyes. Uh, it's a small navigational chart of the Pacific Ocean, with a very particular course plotted from the United States to an island in the middle of the ocean. The course has more in common with the movements of a small fly than any nautical vessel. It's apparently part of Operation Subaquarium Avendia, but owing to your poor understanding of all languages, you mistakenly think that it's a chain restaurant specialising in Italian cuisine. Oh, Crystallion, have you not seen the uh, this one? This one's a treasure. Turns out Bob is a rampant narcissist and dislikes Ted very much. Okay. We need an orb. Oh, okay, we can get down this way. Here we go. Now, I will say that banterous humour in video games can be difficult. Um, so, so much is relied on delivery. And that is something that's always easier said than done. Um... I feel that if you are in possession of the ability to write uh, entertaining dialogue or humorous dialogue between characters, that then it's just finding a way to deliver that. Um, again, I'm sorry I keep bringing it up, but... Um, excuse me, cheeky t-burps. 
something like the Borderlands series does allow you to essentially have the player's actions separate from the dialogue that's going on. Now, that can lead to a point where the player might be eyeballs deep in shooty gun bang and is just not paying attention to what's happening, so it can be lost. Um, and if you are yourself playing as a character, you can let the characters be funny. Um, what I found is that... Uh, sorry, you can let the characters be funny. What a wonderful, insightful thing you just said, Will. Here's how you make a funny video game. You make a character, uh, and then you make another. And then you let them be funny. Ah, that's right, good. Thank you for coming to me, TED Talk. I'm sorry, friends. <laughs> I should take a stop and a breath. Um, God, I don't think we're going to get this finished in time. Friends, you might be able to to play through this on your on your glorious the rest of this on your glorious selves. Yeah, Kester, I'm gonna drink some water. The eye twitching should have given it away. Um no, no, so what I was gonna say is like, you can have two characters in a pre-scripted situation, be it cutscene, uh a, a situation which you where you are supposed to go, but bloody things you need to find out on your own. Stop being such idiot. <laughs> Firstly, no, I will not stop being such a massive idiot. You can't make me. Um, yeah, so the way in which two characters' dialogue is delivered. You know, you can have a pre-rendered, you know, mo capped scene with VO as well. That can be tricky because, like... Any kind of finesse delivery that isn't, like, over the top can be hard to convey there. So you're relying on the vocal performance. Now, if we go back to Bulletstorm, Bulletstorm was an absurdist game that really, really missed its mark. In fact, at some point, we're going to have to play that um, because there's a, so much that it does right and there's so much that it biffs or comes close to greatness. Uh, there's a scene where you get to play you're in a model village and you get to remote control a knockoff godzilla stomping through it all and it is fucking hilarious and it, it it almost lands a great humor game but the problem is it's they try to ground it all in this whole story of vengeance so your character is simultaneously mourning the loss of his pirate crew and trying to save the ones he can and, you know, stoked in regret from past mistakes. Ah! If I put gin in my tea, does that make it ginger tea? Okay, firstly, Caffeine, thank you for a thousand bits and scattering a large amount of corgis to the four winds. Seriously, thank you. Uh, secondly, I hate that I have to agree with you and say yes, because I don't want to. <laughs> oh, sorry, and Bacon Avenger, thank you kindly for filling the pint glass. The Yaldum is yours. Caffeine set you up for success there. Uh, also, uh, so Caffeine, how are you doing, friend? Uh, they released the, um, the stuff I did for PAX Online, so I got that glorious thing to listen to later. And, um... Where are we going? In a giant circle? Stupid. Uh, and there has been a bunch of stuff on the, um... The charity event, so... The poll is up. People are already doing battle, even though I asked them not to. So that's happening. But it's, it's going real good. How's it going with you, dude? <laughs> oh, Night Valen, if you've never been subjected to... Uh, a direct one-two combo of Moose and Pun Spectre on comms, then you have not you have not experienced pain. Oh, a daily planner in from 1988. The final page consists of six appointments: 9 a.m. do nothing, 11 a.m. pick up new fedora and glove, noon torture stupid corn for amusement, 3 p.m. hide to avoid work, 4:45 torture corn, 6 p.m. initiate master plan. Ah, uh, Federico. He never made it. Oh, sorry, Fernando. Oh, wait. 
Hey, Fernando, could you be a pal and place the tour brochures across the facility? There's only a few hundred, so you should be able to get it done in no time flat. Uh, Fernando, you cretin. Ignore that idiot, idiot Bob's request. What you really need to do is sort the samples in the genetics lab from least to least reactive to most. So go do it. And then Bob's like, hey, Fernando, got a more important job for you than that. I need the statue directly above you moved an inch or so. Scaffolding's already set up, so you'll finish in about an hour or so. Thanks. Followed by Fernando, you lazy oaf. Don't touch the statue. We don't need another insurance claim. Instead, go to the second floor of this barn and observe the corn's behavior in their habitat for several days. And don't move a muscle that'll throw the data off. Cordially, Ted. Hey, Fernando. Hey, don't worry about that observation stuff. The corn will take their own notes. Really need you to hang about a few dozen more paintings around the place. Just a... Just be a pal and set that up, would you? Please, thanks. Fernando, you twit. Don't lift a finger for those paintings. Instead, use this pen. Draft a letter for me. Dear Bob, you are a nitwit and idiot. Cordially, Ted. Cordially, Ted. A book titled The One Second Assistant. A particular book on how to be an assistant in the workplace, whose end appears to do as little work as possible. Chapters include How to Shred Everything, an office intro into hiding in the office and shifting the blame onto an intern. Medicine ball. What do you do? Coffee trolley. Now coffee. Okay. The fact that we're out of coffee is a travesty and we will be solving this. <laughs> stupid, stupid. Ooh. We we found the master plan. Okay. It appears to be the only thing Fernando, the founder's assistant, put any effort into. Aside from shredding important documents and wearing fancy fedoras and gloves, a very poor plan involving jumper cables, a strange lightning rod, and somehow turning into an all-powerful god? Notes read that the stupid corn told me their secret, and Bob and Ted will be my assistants now. Yeah, poor Fernando. We used his perfectly preserved hand to get in here. Just as an FYI. Uh, I think we need to cut the ball in half though, don't we? Yeah. Oh, God. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Lizzie's asking if the comments are calling me a bad fake actor again. Sadly, no. Okay. Use the marker to draw the worst face in the world. It appears t uh, you took drawing lessons from a leather couch. No, so far, Lizzie, I haven't been uh, accused of being a uh, a Hollywood sellout or otherwise. Which, uh, at this point, I don't know if I should be uh, impressed with or uh, disappointed by. Alright. Hey, Ted, since you worry about security, I did you a favour. Beefed up the doors in your room. You're absolutely welcome. Bob, you joke. I can't even get into my room because of these stupid discount security measures. Fix it. I'm sick of sleeping in the grotto. Okay. Oh, this is. Oh, that does not sound good. Aha! I finally found you. You've fallen into my clutches, just like all the others. I must say, I'm quite disappointed. I thought you were more clever, more interesting. But no matter. Now, your suffering will be so incomprehensible that your small mind will Stupid break. Plant, why is your face like that? But what is that? Your stupid face is very bad. Dumb plant. Is that on purpose? <laughs> Shut up, you mean furry stupid. How dare you? I am the pinnacle of my race. You will pay for this insult. Let me just... Ow! Oh, what's up, boy? Or get me some new you lazy law. Jeez! That's biting is cheating. I win by default. Ha 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 Your plans have been foiled by my plan, which are better than yours, you dummy. 
and I am most certainly not retreating. <laughs> you know, this place is filled with idiots. As she says that dead eyeing us. <laughs> Just to M's with get So that happened. Get fucked, cord man. Okay, let's let's explore whatever this glorious little pile of nonsense is. What's tomorrow? Oh no, wait, no, that's me. I see, sorry friends, I don't think we're going to finish this game in the next 20 minutes, because I do need to, to bring our adventures to close, like, round about six-ish. Yeah, tomorrow is Frankie Day, and I simultaneously am terrified of it, but also I'm looking forward to it, because we just got into the deep, deep. Well, the deep, uh, Dave sends their regards. But... Now I'm like, I really want to finish this with you lot. What if we turn Thursday into a double header? What if we finish this and then start uh, Journeys of a Broken Circle? Ah, but see, then we end up with two heart. Mm. Darn it. Why do video games have to be so good? It's not fair. Stupid video games. Stupid good video games. Moose says, yeah, so if we come back for the amazing conclusion. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Alright, well, I mean, we can explore this teeny tiny room, which is at least not a slovenly hellscape. Oh, a unicorn candle holder. This candle holder carving of Dave, the legendary unicorn brought to life by a hang by a hungover demigod, this magical creature possesses near infinite foresight and a complete lack of spatial awareness. It fell to its death immediately after it was created. Oh, a jar of Navranka, cheap knockoff, well-known decaf coffee brand. Ranka is, is unique in that it doesn't taste like coffee whatsoever. Instead, the makers went for a taste and texture of an old boot. It's the only thing in the facility... Uh, it's the only thing that facilities coffee trolley delivers. God, and he tripped over that one eight ways from Sunday. Ted and Bob, you two deserve each other. Oh, here we go. And another item of the portfolio. Local teens win big science... It's an old newspaper clipping that shows a very young Bob and a very young Ted winning a science award for artificial intelligence prototype. Judging by their demeanour, their partnership hasn't changed much since then. The article notably praises the display's slick presentation, spearheaded by Bob, and completely ignores the sciency part, which Ted did on his own. Urge to raise about group projects rising. Here we go. Concerned lab report. <laughs> okay, a lab report outlining further tests on the facility's breakthrough test subject, the famed female Ruby Queen Corn. Much more concerning than the last one, it uses phrases like can't be controlled, the corn follow her, and too much British. <laughs> Recommends uh, uh, sequestering subject as soon as possible until further notice. Wow feel fecking called out and then some <laughs> that's not even that's just mean oh and here we go ted's journal okay so written entirely in blue pen perfectly sized paragraphs this uh sorry written entirely in blue pen in perfectly sized paragraphs is the most depressing diary known to man highlights include many thoughts on optimal stock organization regrets on his partnership with bob and sadness that his own project, an experimental AI program, couldn't get funded. Aw, that's you, little buddy! Little tiny grumpy buddy. Oh, 
And I'd say that um, there's definitely a universal measure of too British. All right, put the jar in the trolley. And away we go. Oh, what's this? A script for a Broadway musical? An autobiographical play about the story of an albino cornstalk's quest to destroy something called flesh bags. The story has several continuity problems, and the choreography makes absolutely no sense, unless the dancers gain the ability to transform into a quantum state and teleport from one motion to another. <laughs> Aha! Step ladder, handy. Um, you vaguely remembered a ladder when you spotted earlier in West Hook 2 that you could access with the help of the step ladder. You noted that your observation happened either a few moments ago or several centuries ago because you have little to no concept of linear time. I love it when games just call me the fuck out. Use my name! You can use my name! I'm calling bullshit. All right, a bag filled with garbage. Added to, added to folio. Maybe it was the smell. Maybe it was the way the light caught the plastic, but something about this particular garbage filled bag caught your eye and never let go. You will carry this with you, always. Bob, I don't care how much you love this third-rate popcorn. Stop framing ads and handing them here. It's stupid. Professor Poppycorn. Collecting all of this garbage will not make you less stupid, idiot. <laughs> Why are you so mean? I will check the, um, the description on this one. Bob was so enamored with this Forbidden Snack brand and its mascot that he framed a number of his favorite advertisements and placed them over the facility. They were removed immediately by staff. If you ask Nightly, Vladdy can fix the door back in level one. He won't like it, but he'll do it. Craft glue. You figure this glue may come in useful at some point, once you finally manage to unstick your head from your shoulder. Once again, hurt and offended. Hiya, Ted. Just, uh, just to let you know, uh, I spilled soda on some of your things and uh, put them here to dry. Nothing serious, just some moldy old photos and papers and your important pile. Sorry. Bob, I hate you so much. Cordially, Ted. And we're back in the kitchen. I can't remember where the ladder went. Crystallion's pointing out that maybe Ted did, Ted did end up murdering Bob. Considering how many things in this place say the, um, the Bob Memorial Reactor and the Bob Memorial Lobby. Yeah. But then I wonder what happened to Ted after. Open circuitry panel. Why does Bloody have to fixing everything? When is it idiot's turn? <laughs> oh dear friend. It's always idiot's turn. Bloody not even sure what to fix. Is Bloody supposed to hit stoop? <laughs> American garbage built by idiots. <laughs> oh, Vlad, don't have a change, buddy. You are a treasure. An absolute treasure. See if anything's uh, opened up this way. I do like how the way the humor is structured in this game, it can very, it can very, very clearly point us to where we need to go next. I do like that. Sorry, Ted. Oh, excuse me. Well, that creeped up on me a whole bunch. What's oh, so I... What a mess. Is this place where all the garbage come from? Quite possibly. 
I mean, backtrack and backtrack and mode. Uh, Crystallion says Vlad is implied to be corn. That uh, uh, implied to be Ted's pet project. Does that make corn Bob's project? From what I've been able to glean so far, they both worked on the corn, but it did not end up being what they had hoped it was going to be. So there's West Hook. Darn it, where was I supposed to go? Oh, West Hook 2. Okay, here we go. The fact that the item descriptions tell you where to go. It does keep it from getting to be too, too stodgy, you know? Where was it? Where was feckin' stairs? Were it up this way? I think it were. It was in one of the corners of one of the uh, reactors. If I remember correctly. Should be this one. And I remembered poorly! Wait, no. Ha ha! Boof. Boof. Still in a dream, Snake Eater. Climbed ladder, Vladdy follows you, somehow. Okay, is it me or is this better a striking resemblance to the um, Velociraptor pits from Jurassic Park? What have we here? Runoff control, okay. The men living here look very bored. Security quarters. Oh no, this is... I am going to end up tipping this over. I can sense it. Oh, boring security report. Okay, one well, of many reports written by a lone soldier charged with keeping the facility safe. After reading this, it seems that that wasn't a problem. Most entry logs are variation of the phrase nothing to report, uh, also containing a running count of crossword puzzles solved, which numbers in the tens of thousands. Though I will say, um, I used to... Oh, this is gonna fall over. I can sense it. More stupid garbage, idiot. <laughs> and see which welcome back. Uh, I, I do not remember from whence you left off, but oh, got another pizza flyer. Vive la pizza! A flyer for a local pizza restaurant that looks like it was frequented often by facility staff. Also includes a special for their signature uh, quintuple cheese pizza, which offers. Which it offers to customers for free if they can finish it within 20 minutes or less without suffering a massive heart attack. And Kestrel, I'm trying. I'm trying not to knock over the Super Cup Tower. Uh, also, uh, you carry this as a reminder to stop every once in a while and sit, clear your mind, and ponder on the meaning of all things. You will never do this, not once in the course of your adventure. Instead, everyone else will wonder why you were wearing that chair as a hat. Okay, I did not knock it over. Check me out. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was like, oh, that is a cup tower. I thought it was a pipe organ. I can see what you're thinking. Bloody glad he cannot smell. It would be worse than garbage here. Warning contains hazardous chemicals. Please do not work within 50 miles without protective wear. Cool, I'm just going to stand here and huff in that goodness. Good times. Great times. Hey, 
a life preserver. You like the exotic red and white pattern of this interesting item, which is why you picked it up. It never occurs to you that you might be able to use it to float on water, so you just wear it like a bracelet. Like a bracelet. Ooh, and who have we got here? You're not really sure if this particular rock is a rock at all, or simply a very cleverly colored sponge. Jump and see if you get any superpowers. The rock is named Jarvis. All right. 200 bits, I'll jump in a pool. Currently, it is not letting me, but I want you to know that I tried. I guess we use the wrench on the... the drainage valve. Yes, Androp, you're right. We did see some sticky notes about this pool when Bob, instead of ordering a chemical waste um, disposal facility, just got a cheap pool. Use the wrench to drain the chemical runoff pond. The smell remains. Please don't be full of screaming zombie corn. Please don't be full of screaming zombie corn. Okay, break an adventure. I don't know if this is going to count to the get in the pool, but... Aha! A key for the toolbox. Can't remember where the toolbox is. Oh. We just inhaled chemical vapor. I'm sure that's fine. Oh, and we you can... There, sir. This needs some repairs. Yes, it can't do that thing it does anymore. What does it do again? Those places. All oh, right. Yes, I remember. The corn says hello. A piece of junk. Okay, so it's near the spire. Ah. So, dear friends, I do lamentably have to stop bringing our adventures to a close. I know I'm being very, very casual doing only, uh, doing shy of, uh... Oh, hello. Tea party in progress. Do not disturb. Ah, oh, see, there we go. I knew we were going to have to bring it to a close, but I didn't realise the tea party was starting without us. <laughs> and I, if I haven't told you the story about how I got ratted one Christmas by the process of sticking models together in a sealed room, then that is a story for another day, my friend. Okay, friendos. So, whether or not we choose to play through the rest of this together, I don't know how much there is. We can make that choice, like, tomorrow, um, and then on Thursday, if you want, we can finish this before we start uh, Journey of an Unbroken Circle. Sorry, Journey of a Broken Circle. Um, or we can leave this, and if people want to pick up a copy and play it themselves, like, it's very entertaining, especially if you haven't seen all of it. But this has been a lovely little session. I'm... It's, it makes me feel super happy when I saved a game for us and it ends up being fucking hilarious or fucking brilliant. Do you know what I mean? Oh, Kestrel, thank you for teeny tiny end of stream bits. They certainly help. Um, okay, so. Let's plug nonsense. Let me roll credits and I'll find someone lovely to pass you over to. Um, sorry, you're going to have to hear about this all week. Charity event is on Saturday. Uh, if you want to know more, please head on over to the Tiltify page. Um, if you want to natter at me on the discords, I'll be about... Um, though I'll probably be uh, incommunicado for a couple of hours because, as I said, we're going to go um, uh, meet up with the Seattle Indies, so it should be lovely. Um... There was one other thing that I was going to tell you about, but it has dropped right out of my head. Oh yeah, and if you want to see all the um, the glorious walk everywhere, packs online nonsense, 
Uh, I've dropped it in Discord. I think I've dropped it in Discord, but it's over here as well if you want to give it a listen. Because I did a thing and I'm right proud of it. Right. Yeah, I think it's just roll credits, find friendos. Yeah, sorry for looking a bit um, crazy wild-eyed. This has ended up being a lovely day. Oh, Crystallion, I'm real glad. Honestly, if if I didn't have to go places, I would continue throughout. Yeah, Fearless, I'll see you down there. Hehe, <laughs> it's going to be good. Right. Let me roll credits. Let me say thank yous before my brain drifts off into the ether and I become a complete vegetato. Which is like a vegetable potato. Which is twice as tough. Fake. Doll! Watto and welcome! Come on in. I'm just rolling credits. But let us bring our forces together and then we will find someone else to crash into. No, no, it's not bad timing. I mean, I'd love to spend more time with you, obviously. But no, we'll bring, we'll bring our two crews together and we'll crash into someone else. Our forces combined! But I do need to say thank yous. Uh, firstly, Favor Six, Caffeine, Fearless Sun, Sadlin, J Post, Lyris Dragon, Wolfcrad, Quasi, Ross Whitelaw, Tenwin, Reflective Gamer, Van der Beast, Kestrel North, Bacon Avenger, and the Stammering Gamer. Thank you for Yoten Bits because they literally keep me alive. <laughs> oh, and Tall Tales. Maze was amazing, and you deserve it in your life. Uh, to Caffeine, Lizzie T. Power, and Rhymes of Moose, and also Tarlicus, thank you for being the best mod team a person could ask for. Uh, of new followers, we gained a bunch. So Cheese Sleeves, not that one. Uh, Chenis Madungus, uh, Snob San, and View Ha. Thank you kindly for follows, and I do hope we get to, to chat and hang out again. Now, those that subbed, resubbed, or were hunted by House Carl, I'd like to thank the Orchazini, Alnus, Rhymes with Moose, Lost Flowers, Gilmargre Joy, Martin. The Stammering Gamer, Unitax, Num Nums, uh, Wolfie the Proto, uh, Lord Hasmodius. Can't, I, honestly, I can't do that in a normal people voice. Uh, Sindron, Solon Face, Redbeard, Sheu Uwu. Is lost again. Oh my word. Not Terra Luna the Bear, uh, Deshel Washbear, <laughs> MC Catmaster, <laughs> JSCTH. Don't distract me! Neuro Wire Junkie. Uh, God Beardman, uh, Kitsuno Kitsune, uh, Favor, Exo, Steel Fox, and MDH writes, thank you kindly. Um, and we got hosts from Hey It's Fiona, Sinden, uh, Nuges, Nuges? I'll, I'll get that right eventually. Captain Stephanie Barnes and the Lost Flowers. And to Toll Tales, thank you for bringing your crew in. Admittedly, as we were bringing our adventures to a close, but it's still, it's still a big compliment, and thank you kindly. All right. You know what? Let's go hang out with Thor. Let's go hang out with Thor. I know he's playing um, uh, a new MMO. He's doing a, a spot of the Lost World. But you know what? I know if I leave you with Thor, I'd be leaving you in good hands. Yeah, so let's head on over there. Look, friendos, today... The company and the conversation was excellent, and I can't say thank you enough for that. Uh, Lyrus, thank you for sneaking in 100. Uh, and Toll, I am going to the Seattle Indies meetup, so if you're coming along, I will see you in a bit. Uh, I didn't get to go to the Indies picnic because it was on a Saturday, and it was in the flamey reach of the Daystar. <laughs> but I will see you over there. Right, friends, thank you all for a lovely day. Um, thank you for bearing with me while I've been pretty much universally scatterbrained with sorting the charity event. And your your ideas, both helpful and torturous, have been very, very useful. Tomorrow we return under the waves for Subnautica, which we have been playing for 11 weeks now. I love that game. I feel... I don't know how close we are to the end, but I... It might it might be the last session. I don't know. Like, I don't know if we have to... Bloody follow, bloody carry, bloody do everything. Always, always bloody. 
I don't know how it's going to go down, but I'm glad that we've gotten to do it together. But I, I think we've maybe got one or two sessions left in that. Right. Give my absolute best to Thor. Have a lovely rest of your evening. I'll talk to you on Discord. To be continued. God, I can't.